This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, everyone. We are just watching this glorious sunrise across the landscape here in the low veld at Juma Private Game Reserve. Listening to the chorus of the birds and the sun has given us a little bit of an indication, the essence of what the day stores ahead. It's already quite high in the sky, so the ambient light, wow, it's very, very bright. And it's wonderful to just sit and listen and see if you can pick up on any cues. But since I didn't, I am going to be heading to the hyena den to see what I can find for today. So welcome aboard, everyone, to your very own live safari through the African bush. Welcome aboard. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Your live safari across different locations here in South Africa. I already said it's a glorious morning. I can't say it again, but it is. It's warm, blue skies. The sun is up. My name is Lauren. I do have Johan on camera today. We're very excited to get to the den. I did hear potential baboons alarm calling at the dam cam behind us. So that's why we've came here. Just to listen, see if we can spot any tracks and just to admire the landscape for this morning. Sometimes it's important to soak it all in. It's 24 degrees Celsius and 76 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's very pleasant. And of course, this is live. The birds are talking to you as they call. You must talk to us. Please send in all your lovely comments interesting questions and a joke or two if you feel like it use the hashtag wild earth on twitter at fc on the youtube chat stream or you can head over to wildearth.tv slash explorers now kids if you're watching which we very much hope you are you send in your questions via email kids questions at wildearth.tv they're always the hardest the questions from kids the ones that make you think Okay, Joanna, are you ready to bumble? I'm going to head straight for the den. I just wanted to see if we could pick up on tracks of a leopard. That's normally what baboons would alarm call for. But sadly, not today's. So I'm going to race to the den and we're going to send you guys across to Andrew to say good morning. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, such a beautiful antelope right in front of us, having their own time feeding very smoothly, all comfortable around in this area. All just a full male looks like it. My name's Andrew. On camera I have Simon this morning and it is happy birthday, which is fantastic to have him with us. And so we begin this game drive, come to this position of western side of a quarantine where we find a uh, four antelope which is our impalas and again they're just enjoying these dew grasses which is wet moisturous that's what they love about actually doing this kind of feed early in the morning where they don't actually need to go to a water hole yet they get moisturized from these grasses and the temperature is still down today well we're standing on 24 degrees, 76 Fahrenheit. Typically a morning like this, it's where we're gonna stand and I think it's gonna rise during the course of the day. So again, my plan this morning would be um, checking again for leopard tracks, see if there's gonna be any tracks that come in since yesterday we were tempted to actually follow up on Etingana, but we didn't actually get in like, which I believe we're gonna, if we find a, his track somewhere in the roads, he's probably had a long night, I believe so. And it's always 
very good to stop with impala because sometimes leopards would hunt this type of antelope around here. So to talk to, to us, remember to use kids' questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, also, the hashtag wildearth at FC uh, on YouTube. You can go to YouTube. And also wildearth.tv slash explorer. And this is how you're going to be interacting with us. Get to know what is in the bush, what you're talking about in the bush. Access you to participate on questioning and you get to know all about these wild animals we have in this area. Doesn't seem to be much that border them here. Natris, you're right, you know, the impalas and the springbok, I, I mean, you didn't actually go wrong. So these are one of the animals that are very lovely, uh, very white, I mean, very lovely to watch. When you look at them, of course, they don't have a lot of color, only that, uh, you know, halfway on their ribs, bottom, you started to get very much low, um, kind of like a slightly golden yellow, kind of a yellow color, but the underneath of them, you see white. And then also behind them, uh, they have marked with an M, or there is like a black uh, line, which is actually from the top to the bottom, both sides of a, you know, between a tail. So that stand as a McDonald's, if you want to include that tail, also it's got another black all the way down from the top there. So the guides out there, they're giving them name, which are McDonald's. So easy meal of the bush for the medium size carnivorous species or bigger size carnivorous species which lions spend time hunting pilots. When there's not much around it they can hunt. And he found himself in this small group of male only just because of um, of course that's usually for impala to form bachelor group of a male up to about 18, 20 possibly in a, in a, in a bachelor group. So the grasses there are mixed feeder, which you, we see them made it throughout the year, even though the drought take places where they can browse, feed on twigs, feed on uh, dry pods of the trees as well. Never those fall down and uh, pick them up, chew with them. And they practice quite a lot of a fight when they are out there as a bunch of group of male. Nothing else happening, nothing else that you have to do. They chase one another and, and then whoever is hunting them sometimes, for them running around like that, they've got to be careful because they always enemies behind them. These enemy lions, a leopard, they can ambush, take their own time and aim target that it's going to be any close to them and then they can pounce and get them suffocated. So this one is looking because any of any suspicious movement that they're not too sure about they all freeze and they look carefully. But all of them now looks like they're all doing the same. Maybe it's because they lost their eye hearing because of the car that is riding on the far down there. So um, I'm going to carry on, check on the western side of a quarantine. So uh, let's go to Ntswalo to say hello to everyone, uh, JP. Good morning and welcome to Ntswalo in the heart of Kalahari. At the moment we are having a beautiful view of the Kronoberg Mountains with the sun slowly pushing up from behind. 
My name is JP LaRue and behind the camera we have Davi. So our plan for this morning is firstly to wait for the sun to start slowly rising and then from there on start looking for meerkats. In the meanwhile, I would just like to tell you a little bit more about the Korana Berg that we have in the distance. So the Korana Berg gets its name from the Korana people, who is a group of Khoi pe people that used to move up into this area. They're very closely related to the sun hunter-gatherers, which we already spoke about earlier in the show. The only thing that distincted them from the sun hunter-gatherers is that they actually owned cattle and livestock. And these herders would move into this area and live in these incredibly harsh environments. The mountain itself consists of what we call quartzite, which is actually a sandstone deposit or sand deposit inside a shallow marine environment. And over many millions of years, this hardened through um, pressure that was on top of it and this marine environment, creating a very resilient rock type that doesn't weather very easily and thus created this beautiful Koranaberg mountain range. From here on, we'll start moving around, see if we can find any of the meerkats starting to pop their heads out of the burrows. Good luck with your meerkats, JP. I had zero luck with my hyenas. Very disappointed, but that's okay. Not a single peep from anyone is completely empty. Uh, there was two hyenas I mentioned last night following the dogs that we had. We had the Pungui pack, and I wonder, I didn't get to ID them. It was getting very, very dark if it was any members of our wonderful Juma clan. Now we've reached Treehouse Dam. But other than our helmeted guinea fowl that are running at an alarming rate to get away from us, there's really not much activity. Jane, you're hoping the Pungwe pack make an appearance. <sighs> Me too, but I must be honest, they were running very far east on Gairi Main, which is our southern boundary. They were heading right towards the Kruger boundary. But you never know. Dogs get very mobile and they don't seem to have any direction. They don't seem to have any plan, but like me, they bumble. <laughs> and they're not territorial. So sometimes you'll find them around the same area like Juma for quite some time. And then all of a sudden you just won't find them at all. So I hope they do as well. It's been a while since I've had a wild dog sighting, a proper one. But they were heading very, very far east yesterday. We don't get very many updates from the West, which is very sad, but apparently yesterday or the day before, there was some incredible interaction with lots of leopards. Now I heard, the story I heard was Tingana, Hukamuri and Anderson. So I feel that's possibly a little bit inaccurate because Anderson is no longer with us, but there was some sort of interaction over a carcass. And I know that definitely Tinganana, the big banana was involved. So Hukumuri, for a fact, is on Arethusa. I just wish we got a little bit more updates from the West. There's a lot of activity right in the West right now. But ours will boom soon. There was no leopards found yesterday, in the afternoon at least. But because the weather's changing, I wonder, I wonder if they'll start to get mobile. And if a leopard's on a kill in the thicket, and it doesn't move for days because it's feasting quite happily. And you don't have their tracks. There's no way you would ever know unless you hear some sort of alarm call that they were deep in the vegetation, happily feasting on their dinner. I 
think we should bumble, Johan. Let's bumble. Bridget, no, they are not. The blacksmith lapwings are one of the few birds that we have all year round. They are always on the go. Ding, 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 ding. They're very, very aggressive when it comes to defending their little area. And they're young, of course. We see blacksmith lapwings all the way throughout the year. And the Senegal lapwings we actually see a lot here as well, which is apparently quite unusual. If you're a keen birder, many birders struggle to see the Senegal, but here they're plentiful. But the blacksmith lapwings are definitely not migratory. We have them all year round. There's a few birds like that, the lilac breasted roller, they're resident, not migratory. We have them all year round as well. We have a far uglier call. But the European roller, I did not see last year. I saw the year before, but not last year. They did not arrive, nor did the bee eaters, the carmine bee eaters. So I'm hoping for a European sighting this year. They're similar-ish to the lilac breasted roller but they are migrants and they just did not arrive last year. Why? No one knows, no one has the answers. Is it some sort of effect of climate change or patterns changing that we're just not aware about? Seasonal change, shifts. It can't be food if you look around us. Food is everywhere. I'm not sure why we didn't get the Europeans last year, but it was very sad. I'm just going to do a quick dam check. I can hear some sort of activity going on on the southern channel, so we're going to switch over to that. And as I do so, I'm going to send you across to Andrew. Thanks, Lauren. So we're checking now the Vietella Exis, which is the main road to the camp itself from the gate. And it's actually clearly sand here where if it's ever any leopard tracks or anything that have moved through here at night you can able to tell that quite easy but so far we've seen quite a lot of probably that's why Lawrence didn't get luck in that in a den it's because maybe they've been also on forage the whole night and they gotta be uh, behind a big cat such as a lion or leopard and uh, this is how they do they also rely on other cats to hunt for them but they can hunt not only that they can only steal from the others hyena can hunt and succeed in her hunting so again i'm gonna go back to the, the western boundary to recheck where the guys lost him coming into the area. You never know, maybe after darkness, whether he followed back on to the west or whether Hukumuru followed him back into Juma. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's it's good when we're there, we'll be able to find out and we get to know exactly what happened. So it's, that's definitely that one cat has to be some way can't be together for a long time when the fight take places won't take two days probably one day or so or a couple of hours whoever gets lost the fight and then it will take its own route away from another one so that's what you usually do for 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 leopards so unless that he if maybe he would he was uh, not at least. Johnny, yes, I'm also wishing that, you know, we had a luck or chance to see a lot of um, um, Luwati male, which is also one of the big male that, you know, we believe he could stick around quite some times here. And since he come, he's coming too much, that's why. Uh, Tingana is not actually feeling comfortable anymore when he moves doesn't have a 
properly uh, territory area. Wherever it goes, it's probably been pushed so much about between these two mills and Hukumuru and, and Mlowati. So and that's why he sometimes can force himself into a situation trying to fight even though he doesn't really want to. And it's going to be bad if finally he lost all of this fight because then he has to sneak everywhere uh, in and out of somebody else's territory and hunt within somebody's territory. They doesn't or anything showing any dominance because those dominants won't like that. I love SA. So uh, we haven't actually had any news with our princess Lalamba and then we believe she must be maybe on the uh, west, or, I mean north sorry. The only update that we th we heard, somebody thought that could be maybe her tracks that were seen east um, between the boundary uh, Touchwood and the, and the Beverly Sook there. So if it's not a Sally, then could be her because they share a boundary between these two. You know, Luna sometimes, I also haven't seen her for quite some time, so it could be her Lalamba. She's looking for um, to reproduce soon, so wouldn't really surprise us if she hooked up with a male somewhere else who would mate with her. But if it's that so, she won't go forever because this is her area of territory that she given by her mother Tandi. So. She will come back here, yeah, maintain it, so I'm sure we'll get to see a lot of her soon, wherever she is. She might return back here. Yeah. So there's a pile in front of us there, we're just gonna stop with them, just to listen around the bush, if there's gonna be any of an alarm call from Impala, from also Kudu, or other antelope, where they can also communicate and warning sounds where if they ever see a danger. Alright, same one, so we got these bottles over here. But now it looks like all uh, they are a young one on the right hand side. It looks like this is actually brooding out. I'm gonna move another forward. Uh, maybe back I think because there, this young one. Their mother already crossed the road. So the older mix there. Looks like a big male is there, which I think is the one maintaining the whole uh, females over here. See how they run across the road following their parents because they're already on the left hand side of us. Move another four, so we get to take a look at them there. So we're gonna carry on, but I'm gonna listen to this in policy. If there is anything they've seen or any other dominant or different behavior that they might see in cats around here, otherwise, we're gonna be moving forward to check more. It's amazing what summer has brought. And just in the space of a few days, the landscape has transformed and these meringues are just everywhere. You can't miss them. Every single water body has these gorgeous, delicious looking meringues that make me extremely hungry. And of course, they're just a nest of the gray tree frog or the foam nest tree frog, whichever, whichever term you want to use. And it's a unique adaptation by these frogs. So what's happening is these frogs are arboreal, which means they live in the trees, as the name suggests. And they've sort of developed a way to keep their offspring in foam. 
and it literally is just foam that's produced by the female. And it's a breeding strategy because they live in the trees. So you won't find sort of these nests anywhere else other than hanging from trees and they're normally hanging above water. If they're not hanging above water, then something's gone very wrong and the offspring are not going to survive. So the foam actually keeps the young moist. It stops them from dehydrating. And that's why it look that's why it's foamy. It's keeping the offspring inside moist with access to water and the minute the tadpoles are ready to hatch they're going to hatch out of this piece of foam and they're going to drop plop into the water let's take a look at where the water is and how high it is from the nests some frogs make terrible mistakes mm, there you go quite high they've got quite a drop can be easy being a little tadpole and taking a nose dive into life, but that's exactly how it works for the tree frog. Hello, good morning to Anbion Gala. We've found a nice herd of impalas in the clearings here and all sorts. You can see a few youngsters there, some females, some young males. Quite a beautiful scene. There you can see a bunch of the females, the young male. Just, it just lowered his head feeding. There we go, the back. So my name is Marna and with me behind the camera is BK this morning. So we're actually on the lookout for any cats, specifically leopard. So we've been in the riverbed, uh, looked for any signs and of the leopard, but we didn't find anything yet. Came up to this clearing, found the impalas and as we stopped, we heard one alarm calling, but it doesn't look like was anything serious. They, um, they stopped soon after, and now they're just all feeding again. Love the movement of those little tails. And this time of year is so nice seeing all these little ones. I love when they bunch together in those little creches as well. But this is very close to where they had tracks of a yesterday if he was close by um you know he'd probably be be watching these young impalas you can see they're very alert constantly looking around all right i think we're going to keep moving um, and see if we can find any signs of those cats. We're going to send you over to Tuolu. Right. Good morning and welcome back to Tuolu. So at the moment we're still looking for meerkats. We just got off a vehicle at a burrow system that's known as Kink in the Road. And from here, we're going to start walking towards that little burrow system to see if they can pop up. But in the meanwhile, we found this little nest of a crowned lapwing. And you can see how perfectly these eggs are camouflaged with a speckling that they have on top of them. One of the other things that I find quite interesting about these eggs as well is the shape of the egg. It's almost like a pear shape instead of a round egg. And this makes perfect sense. If you've got a pear-shaped egg, you can push the three little points to the inside and prevent these eggs from rolling. So it's also easier for the female when she's actually incubating on the nest to sit on them and control the eggs. So we're going to leave the little nest alone. We're not quite sure yet where the female has gone, so that we don't unnecessarily disturb them any further.
They are really cool looking eggs and it's also quite unique. When we see that birds produce eggs, they can either be plain in color or they can be speckled. And it's only through, um, when these um, eggs go through the ducts at the end that they get coated either with blood or bile that creates this unique patterning. The patterning is also very important as when the female is off the nest so that the eggs remain cryptically um, and hidden away from other predators. One of the other things that we often also see with lapwings is that they will actually lay the, le the eggs between droppings of antelopes to further make it harder to spot the egg. Good morning, Lana. I don't think that the, they would move too far away. They'll most likely come back very soon. And therefore, um, I would suggest that we actually leave the eggs in the nest so that if they're in the area, that we don't unnecessarily disturb them any further from returning to the nest. From here on, we'll continue our search for meerkats. And in the meanwhile, we're handing you over to Lauren, who is busy viewing a butterfly. Yeah. We've just came across a butterfly, a brown veined white. I think it's got its proboscis in this water droplet. I think. It's very difficult to see. You can see the club-like antenna. I can see the legs, but I don't know if it's got that proboscis, the sort of drinking straw-like appendage, which is how they feed. They don't have teeth or mouth parts. They suck up nectar through an appendage called a proboscis. Now, one of you sent me an incredibly interesting article, and I do read what you send me, I promise. I do pay attention. And an unusual butterfly was recently sort of spotted and why was it unusual? Well, sometimes you can tell the difference between male and female butterflies because their col coloration and their pattern is completely different. Just like the common diadem, for example. You can easily tell which one's male and which one's female. Not always, not across the board, but there's, there's visual clues in the sexes. And this particular butterfly that was caught coming out of the chrysalis was half male, half female, or it appeared to be. And basically the insect's right two wings, because obviously there's a forewing and the hind wing, were typical of a female. So they were larger, they were brown with yellow and white spots. But the left two wings, the fore and the hind, were much, much smaller. So there wasn't even an equal ratio in the size. And they were darker with splashes of green, blue and purple. Characteristics of the male. So. Everyone was thinking, what on earth is going on here? What has happened to this butterfly? And the species was the common archduke butterfly. You can Google it. And it wasn't a hermaphrodite. Do not be fooled. It has a rare condition called dynandromorphy. And what this means is that you outwardly, so physically, you have the appearance or characteristics of both male and female. So it was suffering from that condition. It appeared to be half male, half female on appearance, but it's not hermaphroditism. It did not have, or it does not have, any creature that suffers from this condition does not have both male and female reproductive parts. So therefore, the sex of this butterfly will be whatever the reproductive organs are. And... It only just has the outwardly appearance of both. Isn't that incredible? You, you can Google this. It's a really, really interesting article on live science. And it basically happens when the sex chromosome fails to separate in the very, very early stages of development during 
cell division and it's actually called known disjunction but apart from that there's been a bit of a failure in the cell division so some of the cells will have the female genotype given the physical characteristics and some will have male genotype and this is what gives rise to a male or a female characteristics in the physical appearance now it can be overlooked it's not always obvious so this condition is quite prevalent in the animal kingdom or it can be but it's sometimes overlooked because the sexes look similar but in species where the sexes don't look similar, that's where it's obvious. And it's fascinating when you see a butterfly split down the middle, split right down that central axis that's half male looking and half female looking. Isn't that fascinating? But once again, it's really not a hermaphrodite. It's not a condition of being a hermaphrodite. But what's interesting is butterflies do use physical cues as well as chemical cues to find one another for mating. So for this particular butterfly, the common archduke, will there be confusion? I think there will be confusion. So for mating, you're going to have to rely on the chemical cues. Is it female pheromones or is it male pheromones? And when male and females and any species look different, that's sexual selection at play. When natural selection was being studied, they realized there's something else at play here. Something else has taken place in order to make the sexes different. So not only do you have natural selection always at work, you then had sexual selection. And passed down over generation to generation where the sexes look different and of course it will depend on the species and the difference in appearance will have their own function but yeah i thought that was absolutely fascinating to have this butterfly look like it's half male and half female i don't actually know what sex it turned out to be the article doesn't state it states the species, but not whether it was male or female. But apparently is seen in both butterflies and birds. Oh, so it appears Andrew has been lucky this morning and he's found us some elephants. Thank you very much. Um, so on our search on the Western sector here, we pick up the single bull elephant. As you can see, he's busy doing his own benefit of feeding. Looks like it's actually one of these male here that are very much solitary or could be some of those male that are around here. But such a big bull like this, he wouldn't associate with females or anything like that. They already get used to move around on their own. Beautiful sound from that woodland kingfisher which is sitting somewhere behind us. Bring quite a beautiful sound. So we saw this bull elephant on the road and then he crossed into this bush over here. Well, they have to do quite a lot of movement whenever the temperature allows them. So if it's many of other friends around here, we're probably going to hear him or communicate, which when he wants to, you can do that sometimes while we're here. Then you can all hear it's like grumbling of, or rumble of probably a tummy that the sound, if, you know, usually come out uh, through the um, mouth or a sound may kind of an internal sound, but it's heard from the outside of their body. And that sound can travel up to sometimes seven kilometers, eight kilometers, and also trumpet sound, which is, that is very loud. 
And this is when they're not happy about any presence of company that's in the area. But it looks like he's going to be hiding. Not hiding, but he's been actually surrounding this mound here, but grazing, you know, um, which grasses that grow in this mound. It's very nice for such elephants and a hippo and a rhino, where it's sweet grass, it's very sweet. And the soil that these temat use to build this mound, it's, it's a clear soil, which is comes kind of a muddy soil. So whatever grows in there, usually grasses and the other sort of other plants which take over during the termite growth. And then all you see on top there is a big tree. Some of these mound can be very old, 60, some of them can be easily 100. Some of them are well abandoned, which is just the mound standing there. And it's not actually well taken care of anymore by this, this termite. It's all just went quiet, or maybe it just moved from there, or he just freeze to able to hear if it's going to be any other other sound of elephant that he may respond into. Well, elephants they eat need quite a lot of food a day. Um, 250 to 200 kilogram, it's a whole lot of uh, plants and grass matter they need. Peel off the bark, also dig from the ground, is, and take this tuber, which is under the ground. Wait, I might say this is actually very good. Summer is always so good for elephants because weather, I mean, water is available and also green it's available so that destruction it going to be very less and they won't just gonna damage tree without any reason when they do that it's got to be a way of maybe they need some special diet that they need in a tree but usually juices which the bark can provide and it's quite a nutritious and juices and then that's why you come across their dung it's it's different from the rhino or hippo, which is only the grass mat in there, where there's elephants, you see a piece of twigs, possible thorns in those dungs. This is how we, when we were growing up, we were told not to step on, uh, on elephant dung on your bare feet, because then there's a chance you get stirred by one of these sharpening thorns or sharpening wood, which has been chopped properly by this promoter they have. So I'm going to reverse now, get out of here. We're in the middle of this bush, but I believe that Safari Kitty, you're very right. And we actually in, well, since this is a low field, um, I think I can hear this elephant take me a very deep breath in there. I just need to maneuver or reverse back there. Maybe we've got a little bit of a his visual there. So you, you're very right. Um, savanna grassland, so consists of all uh, reach in grasses, reach in plants. It's all different uh, type of trees. A um, lot of grasses, different species as well but plenty of these grasses called buffalo grasses. And these are the grasses that often pretty much everywhere and love by grass, I mean by also hippo, by buffaloes, by elephants. <clears throat> Remember when the grass shoots for the first rain, the only thing you see all green before the top seed take places. And what I love about that, all conservationists, they're well aware of how do they control in terms of mow the grasses. If they have to mow some of the open area, they need to wait for the grasses to actually get very a nice seed. And then that time the seed will be dropped into the ground. 
so that from there when we need to mow that grasses in some of these open area we can but not the begin of the growth because then you kill the environment if it, there is no seed uh, for the next uh, maybe two three years that area it's not going to be enough grass that's gonna, going to grow, uh, grow in the area because now you, you're killing all of this seed or you're killing the grass itself before it shed their uh, seed into the grasses, I mean, to the ground. It. So it's well controlled. Looks like our elephant, we can't have a visual of him now. It's probably gone. And I'm gonna carry on. We're just the south of Garigate yeah, checking the main road, which is a boundary between west and the east, Dari. I'm sure if we get a visual again of him, I'll be very much interested because we only saw a brief of him and then he just went around that mound and he's just now gone. It's probably maybe trying to hook it up with some of their member where they could be maybe around or far from there. But he will know all of that, how far they are because wherever they go, they communicate. So he's probably gone, no visual. So it's fine. Maybe we'll find another member on the road here yeah, that we spend time with. Temperature's still good. So there's a so there's a chance that we may find our an antelope or any animal that we're going to find this time of the day and they will be still active. If it's a leopard we'll be still moving. If it's a lion, they will also be moving, unless if they're on a kill or they decided to take a, a long sleep. But antelopes also, they need to move quite a lot before their heat takes place. That's how um, they would be able to feed, also go down to drink. It's going to depend, you know. Since we had a rain, every morning the grasses carry a dew where many of these animals, they love it so much because they don't need to spend a lot of energy look around for water. They benefit from what they eat. They eat grasses that is so much dew and they, it's so much increased in, in water in those grasses. Also rhino, not only the antelope. All animals that they eat grasses. Hippos, they eat at night. But also at night, you know, this is where the temperature, it's very dropped down where and they come so much easier for them to, to grab grasses and they feed on these grasses. A hippo, there will be in the water, some of those, some of them can be outside, those are actually don't really dominate any water hole around here. These bulls, a hippos, find they would be just stuck in the middle of the thicket. So we haven't actually had any even comms from the west yet, but I'm still trying to communicate, see if there is going to be anything. It's going to be anything around here that we can respond. So while I'm pushing further south from here, I'm going to be sending you over to Lauren. I have just left Chitwa. I'm afraid there's a bit of an issue with the mast down there, but that's okay. We're going to pop into Torchwood now and search around First Rock. It's such a beautiful area. It's stunning. And of course, Tandy's Mapinpan, as they call him right now, because a name has not been confirmed. There's been discussions, but no chosen name. So that's what they call him. He's always on First Rock. It's his little territory. He's not territorial at this age, but he's very much enjoying First Rock as his. <laughs> so we're going to see if he's around. It's a bit of a tricky signal area for us, but we'll make it work. If he's around, we'll do our best to find him. And he's at that age where we can spend time with them. Habituation has taken place. I've seen him react both ways to vehicles. Sometimes he sort of does this. He's not too sure if Mama's not around. Hello. We're talking about your enemy, yes. The leopards. 
It's a very small bachelor herd here. We've got two fully grown males and a youngster. Oh, that's what they're looking at. There's a warthog up in the road as well. It's just a warthog. The most beautiful of males. But yes, you can really spend time with Tandy's little one now and he's becoming more and more comfortable with vehicles. Which is a good thing. Look at them, they're not sure about the war talks. <laughs> they're just double checking. It's not a leopard in disguise. And I don't think it is, gentlemen. I think you're safe. See how visual they are. And Palas are very, very visual. As well as olfactory. They also have incredible ears. All three of them are staring at the word off. <laughs> they're not snorting, but they're alert. They're thinking, hmm. What if? What if? I love how vocal impalas are and how they really face their predator. They stamp, they get angry, and they snort. <sighs> it was a terrible snort, but you know what I mean. And they're saying, we see you. You cannot stop us. You cannot ambush us. We see you. And they're being incredibly vocal to alert everyone. Everyone, there's a predator here. There's a leopard. And then the game is up for the leopard. And normally... As soon as the impala starts snorting, the leopard gives up. It games up. They can't continue to sneak up because everyone's aware. I've seen some rams, impala rams, also chase off leopards. They get so angry. And there was an interesting study done on the cortisol levels of impala. I don't quite know the methodology, but it must be very stressful living in a constant state of it appears like anxiety to humans but that's not the correct term a constant state of high alert constantly looking out constantly fearing the predators just around the corner but actually their cortisol level does not sort of spike and increase and end decrease quite how we would imagine it does so they are on high alert but it only spikes when they see or smell or hear a predator. And it drops back down to sort of neutral level again quite quickly. Now remember, the body strives for balance. It strives for homeostasis. There'll be an offset. I don't quite know what the offset is. But there'll be an offset there. As soon as the cortisol spikes, stress, fear, there'll be something that comes in and offsets that spike again to bring it back down to normality. So they're not living in a constant state of sort of panic like you would imagine they are. And of course they're not. That wouldn't be sustainable. <laughs> You're really not sure about these warthogs, are you? Haley, no they wouldn't. They're both herbivores. It benefits, it probably benefits the warthogs actually being around Impala because they are so alert and they are so reactive and vocal. It probably benefits the warthogs. Lots of species of herbivores like to be around Impala. They're gregarious, they're social. Normally they're very numerous. This is a very small bachelor herd. And they'll alarm, they'll alert. And other species can benefit from that alert. But they wouldn't fight. They're not competitors. Oh. That was a snort. Did you hear it? They're panicking. I'm not sure why. They're unsure of something up here. I wonder if it's worth just going to investigate. They're not happy. If they did spot a leopard, though, they would steer it down. They wouldn't run like that. And they're not stotting. Normally, when they run and they stot, you know, there's dogs behind them. And that's because there's no time. With dogs, they hunt by coursing. It's fast. There's no time to stand, think about what you're seeing and snort. Mm -mm, no time. You've just got to run and you've got to stot. 
that stot is that sort of movement where they leap and kick up their back legs. And when you see an impala do that, or lots of impalas, you know there's dogs behind them. They behave differently for different predators. But I just want to make sure we're not missing anything up here. Okay, so we're going to bumble into Torchwood and we're going to send you guys down to Swan. Good morning and welcome back to Tswalu. So I'm currently sitting at one of the meerkat burrow systems of a group that is known as the Khosas. So earlier this morning we actually started looking for the rock stars. However, last night they were disturbed by a potential predator at the um, site where they would normally go and rest. So if you have a look over here, we can see that they had, did dig here last night. This is most likely looking for a scorpion or maybe a woolly chafer, which is one of their meals. So normally by now, with the sun being quite high up, we would have expected them to rise because they do like to sunbathe a little bit in the morning just to increase their body temperature before that they will go active. So it is also potentially possible that a predator might have disturbed them here last night. And there's a wide range of different predators that could have disturbed them and forced them to go and shelter somewhere else. This can range from jackals, snakes, and even honey badgers, as what you recently seen on um, Wild Earth, where the honey badgers actually caught a number of the meerkats. What we also normally see in the early parts of the morning is a little bit of housekeeping, where they will deliberately start flicking out sand. And we also see this behavior quite often in the afternoon, uh, so that they can keep their burrow systems open. So generally when it does come to a burrow system like this, it's not just only meerkats that will use them. One of the species of mongoose which we have over here, which is known as a yellow mongoose, will also often cohabitate these holes with the meerkats. Another species that we also find quite typically in the Kalahari that makes use of these burrow systems, a South African ground squirrel, a very large squirrel, that um, will then in these sites as well. So quite often what we also find that they do benefit from one another in terms of vigilance and by keeping eyes open for potential predator, predators and a, re a return will warn one another if there's a potential threat that approaches. We're going to spend a little bit more time over here and see if they're possibly going to pop out while one of our other vehicles is searching for one of our other groups. In the meanwhile, we're going back to Ningala. All right. Welcome back to Ngala. You arrived just at the right time as we found this female with the two youngsters. The youngsters are playing around the riverbed here. You can just see the back of the female. She's just disappearing behind this the bank. Let's see if they come back. We were following their tracks all along the riverbed. There she is. So a cat of a dis different description. We were looking for a leopard, but uh, can't complain about the lines. Looks like she's turning in this direction. So this female is from the Birmingham Pride. And there are actually two other females that are also, well, they're denning um, on the banks of this riverbed at the moment. Not too far from here. We believe the one female should be giving birth pretty soon. Still nice and cool and we've got a little bit of cloud cover. 
So I'm hoping these uh, these cubs come back into the river so we can see them play. Oh. <laughs> She's going up on the other side now. Blue lady, they're getting so big. They really are. They're growing really, really fast. I mean, they're approaching nine months now. They were found in April. And so, oh, during lockdown. And then they were probably already about three weeks old. So nine months. And she's been doing well, keeping them safe, especially because we've been finding her, um, apart from the, well, we've been finding her away from the pride quite regularly. I can't actually remember the last time um, I've seen her with the pride. But because the pride is so big, you know, there's a lot of competition there. And uh, I think it's actually a good thing that she's keeping them separate. So she's hunting herself and, um, and then the cubs are feeding with her. Whereas in that large pride, you know, there, there are a lot of mouths to feed and then there's a lot of competition. And because these cubs are much younger than the other the youngsters in the pride, it's, um, there's a good chance that they might get injured. Yeah, so the last time we found those other females, you know, the one that should be giving birth soon, it was, I'd say, maybe 100 meters up the river from, from where we are now, and they're heading in the right direction. So there's a good chance that they might meet up with them. They've just disappeared behind the, the bank there. I think let's loop around, see, maybe we can catch them on the other side. So while we're driving here, we're also looking up in the trees. It's also a very good area for, for leopard. I know Bika really wants a leopard this morning, so we're going to try our best. Listening out for alarm calls, looking for tracks in the sand here. Oof, they've gone into a very, very thick area. Let's just see. Alright, so I think we're going to sit here and see if they pop out again. We're going to send you over to one of the other locations. Marina, good luck. Hopefully you find them again in another thicket. But here we came to this far south from the south uh, uh, Gary Main. So we find, it looks like a two female of Angoroma. The guy says that they saw them coming into this area. So as you can see, we'll try and reposition. I'm sure we have time for that. But it's so cool that, you know, they're all well hidden in a thicket. As you can see, it's not actually easy for us for now, but I'm sure we'll be able to get through there later on. You know, these are the Nkoma that also when we talk about the Talamati pride, we also talk about them. They mainly, this time, be around up on the west. And I just heard an update about no sighting of a leopard for sure, they say, but there was a far in the west, the one of our walker, in one of the other property we can't go for now. I'm not sure why there are only two females here, because Maybe they separated. And if that's so, I'm not sure when the separation take place. What a 
would be great once we get a nice visual of them there just to tell how condition there looks like a well looking good to me and they from this far you know as you can see how slightly kind of a painting there maybe they're eating something so small maybe last night that we're not sure about So we're in a now Garimen Junction, the Triple M leads to the gate, main gate. Bridgeman. Um, so you want to know why do lions eat grass sometimes? Um, so lions, dogs sometimes can as well. Most cats, more leopard as well, do that. And many times after they eat grasses, they, they 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 throw out so they vomit and the lions does that or leopard does that or dog you know this is when they may be gone for a few days not to have food so what happened on their tummy the acid it's you know hurting their tummy it's burning up so much so when they eat grasses they finally uh, throw out just to get rid of acid so all they throw out just all of a dirty from the stomach, not a chunk of meat. They won't do that just after they eat meat. You only see them do that when they flat stomach, so this is when the hungry take place. And they um looks like she's just probably a head up, not bad for this female where their heads up sometimes or they might get to move for us. But if they ever move, you know, if they move south, we're going to lose them because we're in right here on the boundary where Juma joined with the southern boundary and the western boundary. might have a long walk from wherever they come from. They probably did a little walk last night. And when they do that, I think it's something to do with you know, maintaining the uh, range of movement because they also can help the male around here, uh, you know, patrolling, you know, things like that. But it's so important that they have male to dominate them, which is still our walkers. And then I know the dark man is still up. When we last time saw him yesterday morning, and then I heard that he was roaring last night. He's probably even moved where they followed, up on the Talamati, and where these one, the other brothers, they were all taking care of the other portion. Well, he wakes both. So I'm gonna. What do you think, Simon? Let, let me try to reposition. Are you alright with that? So I'm going to stay put here, but while I'm doing that, I'm going to reposition so next time we'll get a better look at them. Wild Earth is launching our brand new Explorer program with an opportunity to win a very special Wild Earth expedition. The lucky winner will get a behind the scenes Wild Earth experience at the magnificent and beyond Ngala Tainted Safari Camp. The prize includes a three-night stay for you and a friend with a chance to sleep out in the unique Ngala treehouse. Become a Wild Earth Explorer and stand a chance to win this and many other prizes. Terms and conditions apply. Oh, it's going to be in trouble now. Oh, this is unbelievable stuff. Here comes a hippo in too. Go Impala! There's a hippo coming in. I can't believe what we're seeing here. This is what we'd normally see in East Africa. It's all over. Hippo leaping at the crocodile now. Everything's gone underwater. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth daily. 
an ever-increasing part of the global population is losing its connection with nature. Wild Earth is here to reduce people's stress and anxiety, allowing you to escape into nature even just for a few hours a day. However, Wild Earth is expensive to run and we need help from you to keep this ship going. Wild Earth Explorers gives you the opportunity to be part of a program that supports the sharing of nature with the world. Hi, I'm Kyle and I come to you live every day here from Tuali Kalahari in South Africa. My favorite bird has to be the social weaver, the enormous nest that they create, their survival tactics to inhabit these harsh and unforgiving environments, and as well as their complex social arrangements is truly remarkable. And the interconnectedness with the ecosystem shows us that we are too. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. Right, so we're still with them again, as you can see there now. The visual is slightly better than it was. And they're still under this Medjugwari bush. Actually, their time is not bad. What I can see there, they've probably eaten small things. If it's just the two of them for impalas, it's going to be at least enough for a couple of days to go without. But even though I would be very much interested on hunting again, anything that will pass by here, uh, the antelopes. We know lions are hunt pretty much big game when they need to sustain their whole pride. But when it's not necessarily, they can go for impalas, they can go for anything small, anything opportunity they, 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 they have in front of them. So if they were to kill kudu or a water buck, which is actually a bigger size for two of them, uh, you know that they can stay there for a couple of days feeding on that kudu maybe three days or so, possibly four days. Where Kuru is above 200 kg, and they weigh 150, 160 kg for females. Lion, the male can weigh over 200. Kilogram, 220, 230 possibly. But a day then would consume anything from 13, probably 16 when they're very, very hungry. This huge male can consume up to maybe 17, uh, barely to walk after that. Kilogram. Actually, nice hide here. Nice hide for them to be. Wouldn't be easy to actually just spot, spot them. Daniel, so you want to know how far apart from these two pride, Kuhuma and the Talamati. So Talamati, they were seen, uh, three female, I think, were seen near, uh, near Kruger National Park boundary which is about maybe seven k's from here. And, and I'm not sure how far they've gone last night from there, where this morning you haven't actually been seen or spotted. So roughly from here to where they were seen yesterday, it's anything from uh, six and a half, seven um, kilometers away. Just take it easy. Probably that, you know, where the weather's good, but if they just decided to take it easier for a day, there's a chance they may do that. 
because shader it's great. If they ever move, they will move between this thicket around here. Well, they wouldn't really bother too much about looking too much for water. They probably drank wherever they went. The water's along the road. Since we have a little bit of a rain for the last past few days. Cooking fat, so you want to know the if the lions actually they have a very um, a strong bite force, but you know always hyena is stronger than the lions. I mean, look at uh, the lions, anything from 115 um, a bite per square inch, so that's easily actually to break the marrow of, of the bone and uh, through the marrow when you do that. When they feed, mainly they would go through skin, flesh, these ribs, and some of the the bone that actually it is for them to able to crunch through. They can, but the uh, hyena you know, then they will go for. A, oh, so six hundred and six hundred and fifty. Yes, all right. So we hear a lot of cars here when I'm in the road. Okay. So they would be just chilling around here. The flies also on their back, so flies follow them. And flies that border buffalo border the elephant also border the cats as well. So giraffe girl, uh, there are only two lionesses here at the moment. So the rest of the other pride may be still somewhere else where we probably not knowing where exactly they are. Only the guys update me about the avoca male, which is not a duck man, uh, the other male, which he was seen. It's actually out of reach for us where he is right now. But probably that's where they come from, and they sometimes associate without males able to do comfortable hunt. When the no males not with them, they're missing up because they could hunt less where females hunt well. Hunt world means that they have a lot of a energy to keep on hunting uh, when they have to do that. So anytime they kill, mainly feed without the male with them. I can hear them actually painting from this direction where I'm at right now. So, <laughs> Leslie, yeah, sometimes when I push too much, uh, we, uh, I think it's been a while since uh, I've seen them around Vietella, but they do come there where they probably share some area where they overlap across to that side where also Talamadi do the same. 
So yeah, they sometimes, when they're around quarantine, they do come around the campsite there. But not a lot of time since they were away for quite a while, actually. Just so happy to see them in Gari right now. Hopefully the other bride will, re they will come here or follow them. Or they might actually follow the other bride. And this is when they maybe decided to return back southwest where they just come from. So they, if you look at these, uh, Jack Money. So, well, you know, mamba bite is highly toxic, so it won't survive, will probably die. Where one bite of a mamba could kill even sometimes a cow, where weigh anything from about 800 kilogram so she just come out to the road so mamba it's highly toxic snake out here where these guys always has to be careful hunting kind of snake like that leopard hunt for a python where they find it quite easy once they kill it. They don't worry about getting bitten because there's no venom and they only worried about getting strangled which they will be strangled to death from python. So one is on the road, these two tracks. Maybe the other one is gonna do the same as well. If they're gonna stick around in the area, if they ever move from here to the east, they're probably going to drink somewhere, treehouse them, or a drink just before that, just because of a lot of water in the road. Still a lot of puddle full of water. And eventually the second one also got out. A health looking cat, I think. They're all okay. Levi, um, not that I know for sure of, of uh, them, but since they went and uh, none of them was uh, pregnant, so I doubt if they have uh, cubs for now, but uh, I will double check if there's some of them pregnancy out there, those of those guys that they spend a lot of time with them. So now they're again on move slightly east. We still got them. They're still on the, on Juma unless if they cut south, but they're gonna probably look for another shed. That would be great if they, they breed, you know, so then we have cubs, lion cubs running around here. give them a little bit of comfortable hopefully they would lying down soon or they will push moving so 
Sorry about that. It's a car that is going to be I always on the main road, but the busy road looks like they're cutting pretty much into Juma, where we can spend time following them there. So while we're following them, I'm going to be sending you over to Marne to check with him what's happening. All right, so we are still trying to find that lioness with the two youngsters. No luck yet. We've looped around and we're currently driving the road that runs parallel to, to the riverbed. And we saw some tracks on the road. Um, there were tracks going up and down, older tracks, and then there were a few tracks that looked like um, it might have been them crossing north. So we're going to spend a little bit of time in this area just to see if we can relocate them. They were, they were moving quite quickly. So, fingers crossed that we find them. As you can see, it's quite a thick area. So we're going really, really slow. It's very, very easy to miss an animal in this vegetation. Especially if they're laying down. And when they're down in the grass, you know, what we normally look for is a tail flicking or just the head lifting, looking for the ears. But I think they'll still be on the move. They look like they were on quite a mission. You can see how this is also the perfect habitat for a leopard. Very thick vegetation, lots of big trees along the riverbed here. So nice for them to stash their carcasses in. But I really do hope we find this lioness again. So in the direction they were heading, um, they're going towards a nice open area. All right, so we're going to send you over to Lauren and Juma. We are not having much luck at our side, I'm afraid. But we're not going to give up. We checked Torchwood, but it's too tricky with signal, I'm afraid. So we didn't find anything around First Rock. No sign of the little one. So we're going to bumble on and see what else we can find. There's dogs on Buffelsuk, so if we can get a space, we'll head on in there. But right now it's very manic. They're hunting and there's no space, I'm afraid. I don't know if it's the Pungwe pack or not. The Pungwe and of course that colored information collar and of course that colored information I think it's every four to six hours that will beep where the dogs are so it's one it's easy to see them straight away from the collar and two it's quite easy to find them or at least know the general location that they are in so thick. Maybe Yuan, you can give a mobile view of the, the density of the vegetation that we are facing here. It's wonderful, it's lush. The other side is even thicker than the Buffalo side. I wonder who will be my Christmas Day leopard this year? There will be one, I'm sure of it. I just wonder who. It was Klalamba last year that decided to be my Christmas Day leopard.
into Pufusuk Dam. See if you can see any signs of life there. Hopefully, we'll get on the tracks of some leopards soon. Good morning and welcome back to Tswalu. So for the majority of the morning, we were in search of meerkats at a number of the burrow systems. However, we did not manage to locate them. So at the moment, we decided that it's maybe worthwhile spending our times into the dune fields. So from here, we started moving westwards to see what we can potentially locate. Tualu is an incredibly big property. If you think of it, it's almost 150,000 uh, hectares, which is almost double the size of some of the large private game reserves um, in the Sabi Sands environment. And it does take us quite a considerable distance to get to and from places. Also because of the lower rainfall, we tend to find that we've got lower densities of animals within the area. And once again, with lower rainfall, we also find that we do have a large number of specialists that is adapted to these normally dry environments. And these include Springbok, Kemsbok, which we are hoping to find this morning. So we are also really fortunate. We also might be lucky to find some Cape Yelland, which is also one of the largest antelope species uh, in the world. These guys can often reach up to just over a thousand kilograms in weight. So as we are progressing westwards, you will start noticing that there will be more and more dune ridges that we will be seeing. And these dunes and the red sands that you see in front of you forms part of one of the largest windblown deposits of sand in the world. everyone so our lionesses they have moved into this thicket so we lost them for now hopefully we pick them again up again so it was not actually easy some area where they have moved in we have to go around and there's a drainage line on our left hand side where they might be crossed maybe far to the north on the other side. So I'm gonna try to get out of here and maybe try the the open area on the western, eastern side of us. Hopefully we get them there. We're probably looking for a weather the water uh, they're just getting moved around just to see their area if it's still secure. But we're talking about, you know, every time rains come. KV, so yeah, we, we do get cheetah, but you know, Juma itself, it's not a lot of in the open area, quite a lot. So. Uh, if you have a cheetah, only a few area. This is when they sometimes came across from somewhere and then they come to us and this is the only time you can have them but you, we won't have them for a week running around here because they prefer very uh, wide open area. So this is where the cheetah mainly uh, lacks the most to be. But yeah, we do get the cheetah. Or whether they come from the west, or return back to the west, or they come from the north, across to the south, which they have to cross by us. So I'm gonna try the other side. Hopefully we get them. So I know there's a puddle of water somewhere. If they're then thirsty, they're probably going into those one day. We're gonna check that out.
feel a lot of energy, so the, if, if they gonna keep moving like this, probably when they want to, they will move non-stop because the weather is still great. But we'll find out how far they've gone. Unless if they decided to lie in the middle of the drainage line where we have to go back, work around through this wood around here. Your own? Yes, I might say that they're intelligent animals, mongs or cats, since they they also do the hunting in a group and a corporate feeder, and they are the corporate of taking care of their offspring, which means um, if there's two lionesses or three lionesses in the pride have all cubs together at the same time so they can cross drink from another mother so it's 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 cool that way so they're intelligent also hunting technique in a pride it works perfect or easy for them where they in the pride more succeed than individual lioness or lion find it so much harder for them to be able to focus on target and uh, get it down. Where in a pride they're more likely to surround um, the game. Even in those impalas they're quick enough to get away from the lines but when they're surrounded finally they don't have a choice to all ex escape from that area. Maybe one, two of them will be down. What is cool is that feeding is not ordered. Especially if the female kill, then they're all gonna compete feed. So I'm still on search. I hope I find them. I'm gonna be sending you over to Ntswala. Good morning and welcome back again to Tsualu. At the moment we're looking at pumpkins, which is referred to as a chemspok cucumber. Some of you might know a chemspok as an antelope species, what we do find in this arid environment. It also goes by the name of oryx. So generally, chemspok are very well known to dig up the root system of this specific pumpkin species. And this root itself can go as deep as 1.5 meters in depth. And this is where it often gets water from in incredibly dry times. Over here, we have another one of the seeds. If I can just ask you to pan in over here, and you can actually notice where this pumpkin has been opened up by small little rodents and the seeds has been eaten out. Actually, one of the seeds still remaining inside here that has not been missed by uh, these little rodents. So the fruit itself at the moment is still green, and when it goes yellow, then it's edible. And one of the things that you can often do with these is when they are yellow, is throw them in the ashes of a fire and then roast them and then eat the fruit. One of the things that's quite difficult to do is often find food that is edible if you are in a wilderness environment, especially when it comes to plant food. And plants can be quite tricky because quite a few plants are either very toxic and some plant species are toxic when they're green. So one of the best ways that you can go ahead in terms of testing the edibility of a plant is firstly by cutting off a small little part of a plant itself. You can smell. Any hints of smells that smells like jasmine or almond should always be um, immediately discarded. If you think it's edible, you can put a little bit of a sap on the inside of the soft skin of your arm. And then what you'll do is you'll just wait for a few more minutes. If there's no allergic reaction that you're experiencing on your skin, the next test is always just to put it on the tip of your tongue. And this is incredibly bitter at the moment, which is another cue that you should best, it's best to be um, thrown away and not to be eaten. Let's put this one back over here. The mice can come and enjoy him tonight. I 
All right, everyone. All right. So the other side there, we couldn't get into that drainage line where there's a, like a Y injunction of this drainage line where it joined. So we can't get enough further in there where we saw them going in. So we'll try to go around, maybe enter from the other side. Hopefully we get a gap to get in. Or hopefully we'll find them on the other side, that side there. They probably have eaten slightly, so if they find water in that drenched line system, they're probably just going to go up or decided to lie inside there where it's cooler. That's such a big cat for sure. Won't find himself moving around with their full belly unless if they decided to go back west to rejoin the pride again. So we're gonna go and try and go in there from the other side. The ground is still very wet as well, so I need to have one try on the western sector there where I saw it. It wasn't easy. Maybe from the south side of this direction. Make it lucky though. Henry, um, yeah, I think I did. I uh, did actually stuck in a bush. Well, there is a young bull elephant. Sorry, we're gonna go there, Sage, but we got a young bull elephant right here. So I actually, yeah, I stuck quite a few sometimes in the mud. Well, this is it happened during the off-roading, and actually we didn't manage to get that car out in the very same day. We need to move, leave it there for a while in a bush, and the tractor couldn't actually able to pull that out, and the diff was actually touched to the ground. That I was ever worst stuck I ever had. But yeah, um, second time I stuck away was a four kilometers away from the camp. And all I have to do, because it was a night time, so I have to walk through at night um, to get the camp, because they were highly raining. It all lost the calm, no communication, phone signals down, it's pouring. So, but yeah, I managed to arrive at the camp, safe, in that pouring rain, and I get the car, another car, and another guide, and uh, go get the, well, the guests were left with my tracker, so with a rifle, so I was the only one walking back without a rifle. This is a young bull elephant. Um, I think it's not the same one that we saw, because it's way far, the one we saw, begin of the drive. Probably listening. Fiona, um, you want to know if I have a, ever had a scary situation with the elephant? Uh, no, I haven't. I know elephants; they are dangerous animal. But um, that's how you deal with them if you understand you need to you need to understand the elephant which is very difficult tell their body behavior and this is how you read uh, what they like so bull on must this is one of their male that you will give you a little bit of a trouble sometimes charge car so all you do you keep distance as much as you can So, but with this young bull, as you can see, we right close to him. It's probably what five meter from us, or six meter, and then he's still comfortable with feeding here. But only time you freeze. Just like right now, it's just because. 
probably heard something, maybe other elephants. So they are yeah, hearing its, its crate so that they can pick up very sensitive sound from way off. Especially if it's from, if that sound is from another elephant. So he's probably on his alley over 20 years, somewhere there. This, the sun is actually shining very well through him. Plenty of food for this big animal. Herald. So you want to know if the elephants cry. They probably do, but maybe we cannot see. Only that behavior they give is when they are kind of like in the situation where the other partner die, they pay a lot of attention to the area. And this is where you see them coming back every maybe time, every week to that uh, death area. And that you see how their behavior is going to be very different from the normal. And all the dude is just going to freeze and for maybe 15 minutes. And again from there as a group, it would start to make a lot of a noise, you know, trumpeting kind of a sound. So they probably have a way of a sadness on their heart. Where probably many of animals might have the same way they lost their babies also. Including this type of antelope where they lost their baby, they forget to, they, you know, they always remain in the same area where they lost sight of the baby was. Maybe later, week later, two weeks later, and then they forget. And they take an easy life again. So that probably is a way of them cry that we're probably not we weren't able to tell how, how they do that but kind of behavior they do when they do memorial in one of their graveyard or one of the area where the partner had died it looks like this one is enjoying grasses way under these marula trees are always or buffalo grass we're talking about. It's all soft. And many of these grasses, since it just rained, not a lot of them have seeds. Which is actually quite easy for, for elephants to actually feed on these grasses. You will probably spend a lot of time feeding on grasses than browsing leaves or then it works perfect for them because they don't have to spend a lot of time you know damage trees for their roots where well, this is only happening in the winter where they need to fill up their tummy With this one, you look at the tusk, it actually looks like they're all equal. So Henry, you want to know how far the elephants can go without water? Uh, maybe a week they can go without water. I'm sure, maybe somewhere around there. And sometimes they've been seen far from the water, 70 kilometers away from the water, they can go look for water when it's necessary, but if, if it's no water, then it'd have to reach the furthest water hole around if there is any water wherever far away. It's the same with, this, with the zebra. He's now letting us know that, okay, we're so noisy. 
So we're gonna go around here and see if we can locate our pride. And then I'm gonna be sending you over to Ntualur. Good morning and welcome back to Tswalu. Currently we are looking at a southern um, fiscal. Now these birds are typically black and white and coloured. And because of their rufous behaviour, they were known, uh, named after the fiscal, who was almost acting like a magistrate in the earlier days. So one of the behaviours that they have that is regarded as quite ruthless is to physically hang small little mammals onto the fawns, pull off their heads, and then allow the flies to lay their eggs inside there so that they can feed off on the maggots. The other reason why they do this is to act as a territorial marking to keep other males at bay, but also to impress the ladies, because if you can take care of yourself, it means that you can take care of me as well. I'm just going to see if I can call him back. Oh, you've got him back on the screen again. So the common fiscal, or southern fiscal as it's known, is quite a common bird species throughout South Africa. It's generally more common to the arid western half. And the one that we have over here, you'll notice, is it's quite different from the one that we find in the Western Cape region. It's got a slight little white eye stripe. So it's also fairly easy to distinguish the male from the female. If you look on the flanks, you might see a, a tiny little spot of red-brown coloration. And that will indicate that it's a female. Now, the coloration pattern of this bird is also mimicked by another species of bird, which is known as a fiscal flycatcher. Now, the fiscal flycatcher is quite an innocent little bird in comparison to the southern fiscal, and it only feeds on insects. And one of the ways that it differs is a fairly thin bill that's adapted to insects, while the common fiscal or southern fiscal has a hooked beak that's designed for tearing. So by having the same pattern, it's often seen as a more aggressive bird and left alone by other potential threats. They've unfortunately flown away again. Oh, there we go. That's good. Our bird has just flown off, where we've just got a last little view. But in the meanwhile, I'm going to hand you over to Ningala, where they've currently located on some buffalo. seem to be interested in buffalo. Is it? Maybe. <laughs> I, I, I thought you said, oh, he hates buffalo. <laughs> Let me go forward. Racing to a site. I'm going to have to focus just a little bit here. A Ferrari safari, yes. Ferrari safari today. Very windy. It's dogs, in case you can't already tell. But I just don't want to miss this window of time. If you don't get there in time for dogs, you've lost a sighting. I really apologize everyone, you've caught me at a very hectic moment. I just have to check something. Okay, we're all good, we're all good. So hopefully we'll be with those dogs soon and we're gonna send you guys back to Ingala. So we've found another herd of buffalo. Seems like it's also a bachelor herd. They're just moving through this clearing. Some of them were drinking, feeding on the nice lush grass here. So 
So yesterday I got a question asking about um, their wet noses and if it's a sign that they're healthy, um, like you would see with a dog. Now I couldn't find anything on buffaloes specifically, but um, I did see that apparently in cows, which they're distantly related to, um, one of the signs that they're healthy would be that they, they've got a, a moist muzzle, so the, no, the nose would be quite moist. And you often see the buffalo also licking their noses, I guess just clearing the nose of, of any discharge. A bunch of ox pickers just on them. A few of them fighting on that one we're looking at. There we go. Around the leg. Earlier they were a bit closer and it looked like these buffaloes were kind of riddled with ticks all along the legs. Snazzy says these bulls look old. Some of them, yeah. Um, the first one we were looking at um, had a, like the top of the horn looked like it had a chip in it, uh, probably from fighting. Um, yeah, I'd say these are old boys. But they're still looking looking pretty good, pretty strong. I think it's also because of the time of year, because there's so much food around for them now that uh, you know they generally most of them are in a good condition. You know, if they're not sick or or really really old. There we go. This one's coming out into the clearing. Oh, and this one actually. Have a look at that horn. And right at the top, you can see there's a there's a bit m missing, right on top of his head. Actually, where the ox pick is sitting now. Oh no, ox pick is gone. You can see he's chewing. Now you often see this with buffalo. Even if you don't see them actively eating, you'll see them ruminating or chewing the cud, as they say. So they've got very well-developed digestive systems, four-chambered stomachs, um, and they'll bring the food back up just to extract all the nutrients from it. And then they'll swallow it again, just like you see cows doing. There's the ox picker again. Always aiming for the ear. Ilse is asking if grass is their only form of diet. Ilse, um, they mostly feed on grass if it's available, but in winter time, when most of this grass dies down and these buffaloes are desperate, then we sometimes see them uh, eating leaves as well. So then they start browsing um, just to substitute their diet. Um, I've seen buffaloes eating mopanis a lot up in the north which I don't think is the tastiest thing to eat, but you know, when there's nothing else for them to eat, then they're kind of forced to. But in general, you know, they, they mostly feed on grass. That's what they prefer. And like I said, this time of year, there is a lot of it. They generally don't do too well um, in the drier seasons. So during a drought, the buffaloes um, tend to take strain. There was a big drought here in 2015, 16, and we, we actually saw a lot of buffaloes dying in this region. It was quite, quite bad driving through the reserve. You would smell carcasses, uh, well, around every corner, every second corner, pretty much. The lions obviously had a field day. Very easy for them to take down the buffaloes then because they're a lot weaker than they are now. And in this area, the lions, um, we see the lions catching a lot of buffalo. 
But sometimes you don't see these bulls um, with so many other bulls. You might see one or two of them together, or sometimes they even travel by themselves. Um, and that's when they're in trouble. That one on the right there, um, I think yesterday, we also had a had a bachelor of buffalo and we're chatting about the horns and the color of the horns and um, I was saying sometimes they scratch their horns against these trees and the cambium from the from the bark so the, the inner bark will come off on their horns and it looks like the horns are red and you can actually see it on the on this buffalo's horns there so the brownish reddish patches that you can see all over his horns that's that's from a tree that is scratched against i actually don't know why they're just standing out in the sun it's, it's heating up very quickly now if i were them i would go look for some shade there's one hiding in the shade there but the, the others are all in the sun RKB, what kind of protein do they get from grass? I'm actually not sure what kind of protein they get from grass. Um, you know, there are different kinds of grasses here and they obviously go for the sweeter, more nutritious grasses most of the time. So they don't eat all of the grass on the reserve. Sometimes you'll go through certain areas where there's lots of grass, but you'll see the animals don't touch it. Um, so they do prefer certain grasses over over other grasses you can see a few of them have mud on them but it's uh, it's the mud has dried up so normally when it's hot like today you might find these bulls heading towards these mud wallows and they'll roll around in the mud just to cover their bodies and protects them from the sun so from this heat and it also helps with the parasites so it helps suffocate the parasites and then you'll find that they might go in and rub against a, a, a tree or a log or something and that helps dislodge those parasites and that's also what those oxpeckers are after that we've been seeing jumping around on them This is a beautiful buffalo, the one we're looking at at the moment. Everyone's saying they're looking so big and healthy, I agree. I agree, and like I said, you know, it's at this time of year, um, because there is so much food around, these buffaloes are doing very well. And even with them being so strong and healthy at this time of year, you know, we're still seeing the lions catching them. Um, it's obviously a big risk for the lions because they are strong and they can seriously injure a lion. But big risk, big reward. I mean, that these animals we're looking at at the moment, these bulls, they're probably around 800 kilograms. And there's a lot of meat on that. a nice thing for for a large pride of lions to catch instead of wasting energy and you know catching smaller things this will last them for at least a day or two Dr. Rocky Balboa, are the horns of a buffalo stronger than an elephant's tusk? So elephant's tusks, that, those are, that, it's pretty much a tooth, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's an incisor. And the buffalo's horns, these are, it's just bone, so it's an extension of the skull with a keratin sleeve over it. It's tough to say. <clears throat> 
Um, we do see elephants tusks breaking very often when they you know they because they use those um, those tusks a lot digging for for food and also stripping the bark of, of trees and and fighting especially the bulls fighting other bulls um, yeah it's a, it's a difficult one uh, I'd probably say the buffalo's horns might be stronger just because there's it's almost like they've got a double layer. They've got the bone and the keratin. Whereas the elephant's tusk, it's just like, you know, like a tooth, pretty much. They're slowly heading off into the thicket behind us here. So maybe they're going to go look for some shade. I think we're going to continue. We might head towards the water hole and see if there's anything around there. Have you been watching Wild Earth and dreamt of being right there on safari with one of the guides? Well, now you can. Wild Earth is offering you a chance to buy a ticket to dream. You or a friend can hop on board a live Wild Earth show and join our guide on safari. The ticket is redeemable at any of our locations, any time in the future. Only a limited number of tickets are available, so don't wait. Get your ticket now and start dreaming. Terms and conditions apply. My name is Ross and I'm a field guide at and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. I love getting questions from guests on Wild Earth because I love sharing and learning information about nature with new people and it also makes me feel like you're all joining me in real life. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit your question below our live feed. This is Rusty. He's my favorite vehicle and we've been through all the good times here in the bush. Now if you feel a connection to Juma Game Reserve like I do, then we have a fantastic opportunity for you. You can have your name engraved on a brushed metal plaque just like this one and we will attach it to Rusty so you can always be with us on Safari in spirit. We will even send you a digital photograph once your plaque is mounted on Rusty. Spaces are limited so grab your spot now. Hello, boy. You are a monster. And he's coming right up to us. Hello, boy. Oh, settle down. Settle down. He is very, very close. He's pushing his trunk against the car. You can feel the car moving. Hey, 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 hey. Stop that. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. Good morning and welcome back to Tualu again. At the moment, we're just enjoying the views of the dune fields, but at the same time, we're actually listening to the sounds of the insect. A very shrill call that is made by an insect that's known as a cicada. Now, just to show you a few pictures of cicadas right over here, uh, you can have an idea how they look like. This is an adult right over here, where it has just emerged. Um, what we find with a cicadas is that they will deliberately call to attract a female so it's a males of the species that does make the call and they've got a special uh, circular disc on their body that they'll contract and expand to produce the sound now a number of the males have also learned that their call is not as great as those of others and therefore they will deliberately position themselves quite close by to one of these stronger calling males and an intercept and mate with the females that is attracted to the stronger calling male. So generally the call is actually started by one insect and very soon the rest of the groups will, individuals will also start calling. On warmer days it almost seems that they start calling earlier. So one of the things that we find that after mating has taken place, obviously egg laying is going to take place, and the young uh, insect that is going to develop under the ground will then stay underground between anywhere between four years up to a decade before it will come out as an adult cicada. So 
If you listen, you'll be able to hear these insects again. So just as a little field craft skill, if you do find yourself in the bush and you are struggling to hear something, it's always best to put your hands directly behind your ears, cup them, and that will amplify the sound that you're listening to. We're going to spend a little bit more time in the dune fields and then from there on carry a little bit further north. All right, thanks JP. So we um still in the area. We went there twice in different area from that side drainage line on the southern side and northern side and the western side. Sneaking into the drainage line. So there's no visual of them there. So I don't know, maybe they have... Now we see Impala here also, they take me to ease in the shade where maybe they didn't come west or east here in this patch. Maybe they went north across that drainage line there. And uh, it's not actually easy to see this track. But we're still in the area. We're gonna search from uh, there to the north then because if they were around in this here open area on the eastern side of where we last saw them, it's quite a lot of these spray species here that would be already, you know, seen them. And there's only thing they would move this way, we, would, we thought that is, you know, there's water around in this area, it's a puddle of water for them to drink. So you never know. So we spent time, you know, driving around here because it happens they spot impala before impala could spot them or they could be lying flat in one of these grasses so before we go try something else we're just going to make sure we don't they around or they're not around at all so if impala if they ever spot them they would be already running around here but also giving a lump call Quite a lot. Well, I've, I don't actually think they will move too far away across that drench line. It's probably in, maybe they, they didn't drink there, they were just going to move. Um, like I said, I'm not sure how far they came from last night. So probably maybe just still on the move. It's possible that maybe what we were checking on the western boundary again, if there's a tracks of them while we're doing this site, then might be maybe cross west, which they didn't. So they're still in the block. Yeah. Kelly, so what happened with the female impala? They always, you know, play dominis where the oldest. They would actually, you know, expected quite a lot uh, respect from these young ones. So if they play fight, it's never as serious. But there it's always these adults. They will be respected by the youngest. But those fighting quite a lot are the males, which they, you know, it's fatal when they do that, because sometimes they hurt each other with this horn. It's just because the reason they do that fight, it's for all about dominate. Um, one has to dominate and uh, the loser then move out of the, the high rim. So they, they're in a group of females, they're more likely that they, they cooperate so well that they love one another and they groom one another and their faces and their necks where they can't reach them, themselves. They will rely on the others in a group able to help each other that way. But if they ever push one another, is that maybe one is behaving bad, where you see on the cows normally at home, or horses, or horses that know they bite, but with the cows, sheep, and also, you know, their behavior is that whoever, you know, behaving bad, 
they have a special body language that sometimes can indicate to the other what could be mean that. Sometimes you see them all of a sudden chasing one another. Is that maybe one he was actually, you know, responding in a manner of maybe not respect to the other one? But they're also looking at us. Is that they, you know, seen quite a lot of these vehicles close to them? It happens maybe there's a cat. And that's also how you know, learn things about following the vehicle wherever we're stationary. How you know, would investigate knowing that we had maybe it happens that we have a, a leopard or lion. So that they may actually be um, looking forward to scavenge whatever we have. So I'm going to send you over to Nzualo. I'm going to drive around here look for these two lionesses. Hi, good morning and welcome back to Tswalu. At the moment we are looking at a black-chested snake eagle out in the distance. It's quite a fairly easy bird to identify, however it's also quite often misidentified with martial eagles. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how to separate the two species in a moment. Both of these birds have a prominent black chest and what you'll find is that the martial eagle is much larger and that it's also feathered all the way down towards the feet compared to the snake eagle that has no feathering on the feet. That is specifically an adaptation to allowing to it be more to be more successful in catching snakes. What we also find, unlike the normal scales that cover birds, the black-chested snake eagle has actually round overlapping scales to protect the feet against potential snake bites. So just to give you an idea that these birds can take prey items of up to two meters in length when it comes to snakes, and they do go for very venomous species as well. And one of the snakes that I have seen them taking in this area is Cape Cobras, which is probably regarded as one of the second most dangerous snake species in South Africa, after the black mamba, which is more typical of the eastern half of South Africa. So just coming back to quickly show you a picture of a martial eagle. So here we have a picture of a martial eagle, which as I already mentioned is much larger. Here you can notice once again that it's got a black chest. And then with a martial eagle you'll notice that it's got prominent blotching and once again feathering all the way down to the feet. The martial eagle is also known as one of our largest eagle species in South Africa in terms of combination of both weight, height, and also wingspan. So if you're a bird of prey like a snake eagle, and you do need to feed on something large like a two meter snake, you would actually think that it's quite a tricky feat. However, they make this look very easy. And quite often you'll see them when they are feeding on snakes, they take them head first and slurp them down like a spaghetti noodle. So the reason why they can do this and at the same time still breathe is because of a tiny little pipe at the bottom of the throat, which is known as the epiglottis, which enables air to go through to the lungs while the bird is busy feeding. Hmm. Since of our black-chested snake eagle has just been chased off by another bird of prey which we find in the Kalahari and this is known as a southern pale chanting goshawk. We're just going to move a vehicle forward and see if we can relocate on him. There we go, and that's a southern pale chanting goshawk that has just chased off our black-chested snake eagle. It's quite surprising that he has actually achieved this feat as he's quite a smaller bird. 
So when it comes to these birds, um, we do find them quite often in the arid western half of South Africa. And when you do go to the eastern part of South Africa, we tend to find more um, often dark chanting goshawks. So they differ by white, more white in the wing panel and being paler in overall coloration compared to the dark chanting goshawk. But what I do find fascinating about the pale chanting goshawk is that it learned to exploit its environment by exploiting other animals. And it's quite well known to actually follow species such as a jackal and honey badger and even Cape cobras. And as that these animals are disturbing small little rodents and other prey items, the southern chanting goshawk will come down, scoop down and grab the prey that has been overlooked by the other predator. I've once actually seen them also following baboons and where the baboons were foraging on the mountainside, they were also disturbing small little prey items, which was not taken by the baboon as what they were looking for plant material or corms at that stage and even scorpions. Then the pale chanting goshawk continued following them for up to a half an hour that he was feeding in association with them. We're going to spend a little bit more time with this goshawk and then from there on continue searching for more animals. We have a mating pair of damselflies. Have you ever seen anything so incredible? Making the archway of love. Not dragonflies, damselflies. They've got longer, thinner bodies. Their eyes are together, you see that, they're joined and they're mating. Holding on ever so carefully to the blades of grass. Oh, no, come back. You see the, the body that was on the underside that was curved upwards. That's the female, the male's on the top side. That was so cool. No, come back, guys. I think they've gotten a little bit shy. I don't see them anymore, do you, Johan? Damselflies are much thinner and smaller than dragonflies. They're really not easy to spot. Just give me a few more seconds to check because that was extraordinary. It's not something you get on camera very often because normally they're incredibly mobile and they flutter and fly. They can mate mid-air, but obviously it's much easier to, well, mate on a blade of grass, shall we say. Oh, how unfortunate. We may just have to give you a beautiful view of this dam. This is Koibasi's dam up in Bovosuk. The dam of love, apparently. Meeting damselflies, procreating for the next generation of damselflies. Summer is in full swing here in the Lowveld. Wow, that was incredible. I'm glad we got to show you that brief moment and off they go. Love is in the air. Right, so we've, we've reached the waterhole and there are quite a few different species around the water here. So way back in the distance on the left, you can see there's a, there's a lone wildebeest, a whole bunch of impalas, and there are also some waterbuck um, scattered amongst them. So one standing up on the right hand side of the screen there, and then a bunch of, of youngsters um, just behind it. Oh, there we go. On the left, you can see two more waterbucks just standing in the water. What a beautiful scene. You can probably hear the wind has picked up quite a bit. We are on the on the wall on the side of the waterhole here, so it's quite windy. But it's keeping us cool. 
so we're happy. <laughs> These waterbuck are, they're really beautiful antelopes. Um, you know, and as the name states, they, they're quite water dependent. Usually when you see a waterbuck, um, it's either around water, or it's either where you can't see any water sources, you, you know you're at least within two kilometers of a water source. Very long, shaggy coat. And then of course that distinct ring on the rear end, which you can see in the one in the back. I haven't seen a bull though. Looks like it's mostly, mostly cows, even the ones laying down in the back there in the shade. Oh, they've got the perfect spot here. Cooking Fat is saying that waterbuck is his or her favorite. They are beautiful. I always say they, you know, they, they don't look like they should be out here, you know, in the African heat. <laughs> like it looks like they should be in the snow somewhere because of those shaggy coats. And they almost, I think they almost look like llamas, to be honest, with those long ears. It's one of the larger antelopes we have out here. I think those those waterbuck bulls are really majestic with those long horns curved back. And the one on the right, she's on um it's almost like a little island in the middle of this water hole, just feeding on the grass there. So they also mostly feed on grass. Occasionally you'll see them browsing so feeding on leaves and I've actually seen them um, in summertime I've actually seen them eating marula fruit as well which is not something you often see and we should be getting some marulas in another maybe a month max we can already see the fruit on the trees but they're not ripe yet oh, okay settling down there This is a nice water hole for them to come and relax at because as far as we know there are no crocodiles here only in the west kelly why do water bucks like being around water um yeah i, I guess that's just how they've evolved um, they they like cooling off in the water so you often have seen water bucks swimming in the water walking in water standing in the water like we're seeing there now and they're perfectly adapted for that now uh, you've probably heard about the, these um, glands they have and they they secrete this this oily um, substance from it um, and it also you know, it helps them um, the skin and the hair stay stay greasy so it, it, it assists them uh, with waterproofing um, so unlike other antelopes that can't really um, stay in the water these water boxes are perfectly adapted for that so this is just where they where they like hanging out i think we're going to leave them to it and we're going to send you off to someone else We've just found a female from the Talamati Bridge. She was right in front of the car. I'm going to move you on. She was right in front of the car calling. Mm. Mm, contact calls. I don't think she knows where the rest of the pride are. Now, I have to update you. I'm sorry about the dogs. We were in a very tricky signal spot. We're out here in the wild after all, and there was seven hyenas. It was this huge battle. They were fighting. I took lots of photos so that I can ID. And there was two McLanners, and we were way up at Bushbuck Dam, which is on the Mangaleti boundary, for anyone that knows the area. Oh, hello, there you are. <laughs> Look, she's stalking a lion. <laughs> she's 
She's hiding from the other lion. Look at this. <laughs> that wasn't very frightening, was it? You guys have blood on your face. And you're also going to come to the car. Well, good morning. Blood all down your arms and legs. Oh, they've had a kill. So the one with blood came from this direction and the other one's walking in that direction. So I wonder if the kill or whatever they had is up that way. I don't know which way to go. She's gone into the thicket, which may be quite tricky. Let's follow the one behind us. So yes, the dogs and hyena was absolutely incredible and I do apologize, we tried really hard, but we're in the wilderness, no signal, but I've taken lots of ID shots. It was a Juma clan, way, way, way north, and that just shows you how far they travel for food. They were hounding the dogs, the dogs were hounding them back, and they also chased an impala into the water. The impala panicked, went into the water, was swimming, and I believe it was that impala that potentially lost its life. Now the lion's here. I think this one might be going, I think they're, I don't know. I think they're heading towards water, this one. But you can see they've made a very fresh kill. That is fresh, fresh blood. just have to call this in or I'll be in trouble. Stations, we do have two members of the Talamati Pride in Gala, north of Kayamanzi Dam. Okay, let's go forward. Many of you are saying they look skinny. Yes, they're definitely not full, full, which makes me think whatever they've eaten, they've definitely eaten something, was not large. Could just be an impala, could be a lamb, and that's nowhere near enough to sustain lions, never mind many of them. Okay, let's just see where she goes. Water, I knew it. I think she's gonna have a drink and then take us back to the rest of the pride. I don't actually know where they are. Everybody's killing. Today. But the hyena's got a fair chunk of whatever the wild dogs killed as well. But we often get asked about hyenas and how far we travel and this is very far. We are really, really far from the Juma Den. So it's been an exhausting morning, but at least we can show you the Talamatis back on Bufusuk. All is right with the world. But yes, it's definitely not been a buffalo or a zebra that they've killed. The life of the predators out here is very much feast and famine, so they are used to the sort of famine side. They can sustain a while on just water, and if they were drinking blood from the prey, they can sustain for a short time. But they are mammals, they do need to eat, they need to eat a lot more than the likes of reptiles to sort of fuel their metabolic activity, which is what maintains their constant temperature as a mammal. So as soon as they don't eat and they don't fuel their sort of metabolism will go forward, then of course they'll get weak just like us. They need to fuel their brains, fuel their muscles, fuel their metabolism. But yes, they can go for a few days just as we could. 
But in order to hunt, they need to have energy. They need to be in the energy surplus and not the deficit. And therefore, the weaker they get, the less likely they're going to be able to execute a hunt. And that's also problematic to their survival. So both the lions that we've seen have went in entirely different directions, have sort of done a cross over one another. So I think we're just going to follow this one for now. Heading straight towards Kayamanzi Dam, one of my favorite dams in Bufusuk. Can you hear that? She's content calling. You probably can't hear it actually over the woodland cake fishers. <laughs> They're drowning out every single other piece of ambience. <laughs> The rest of the Pride were called in earlier, so they're somewhere around here. I'm just trying to navigate the, the scene and figure out where everybody is. Oh, and the crinium lilies, how lovely. Favorite lilies out here. And it's getting hot, the temperatures are soaring. Gone are those overcast, drizzly days, I must say. Back to the days where we complain constantly about the temperature. <laughs> Lena, it's five female adults. Just really not that many females. Nine sub-adults, they're no longer cubs. They're anywhere, they range between one and a half years to two years old. And there are six females and three males, sub-adults. And they normally, well, the dominant coalition of males that resides over them is the avocas. And obviously there's three avocas, but it generally tends to be dark mane that we see with the Talamati pride. However, Blondie and Mohawk can also join them. The three of them are the dominant coalition together. It just generally tends to be dark mean that we see with the Talamatis. We're seeing them on Duma, Torchwood, Chitwa. It's incredible, their movements of late. And in the time that I've been here, they've never gone that far south. But it's normal for prides and territories to shift. Seasonal pattern, annual changes, it's entirely normal. But they're spending a lot more time on Juma, which is good. It means we're getting to know them. There's definitely a little bit of a bulbous belly there. There's some sort of... Oh, there's another one. Line number two. This one does look skinny, though, I must say. Jerome, I think it's quite a misconception that the pride must be by one another's side every single moment. Lionesses will separate from the pride for many reasons. To go off on hunt on her own and maybe kill something, execute a hunt and not have to share. She's hungry. Maybe if she's feeling really, really thirsty to go and get water. To mate. Lionesses will separate to mate. Lionesses will separate to give birth. And that's what the calling was earlier. I think we're going to catch up with them, Yuan. The soft contact call. Something like that. A little bit deeper. That's to communicate with the rest of the pride so they can smell each other. They recognize each other's scent over long distances. Just making sure there's no other lines. And they can hear one another. They've got fantastic hearing. So this call. They're waiting until another lion responds. They'll be able to determine the direction and immediately head towards and then call again, response, call, response. So they don't need to be in visual contact with one another. They don't need to be by one another's sides. Of course, it's safer if they are. I think they're heading back to the rest of the pride now. I'm just gonna get around this corner and we'll stop and get a good look at them. So yes, it's entirely normal to find lone lionesses. There we go, work your magic, Johan. 
Maybe something will attract them. Maybe there'll be a smell or a noise that they want to investigate, so off they go, but no one else can be bothered. They are also independent individuals. They're just their social dynamics are very cohesive. The pride is really important to a lion's survival. The coalition is also important to a male's survival. But they can survive on their own. Sir, 50, I agree. It's very impressive. The animals can travel so far, and that's why we don't always see them. We've gone quite a few weeks now without dogs. And that's because they roam, they're not territorial, they're vagabonds. They just go wherever they wish, wherever the, the wind takes them, literally. Lions, of course, are territorial, but they will travel great distances to mark their territory and also to find food. The Inkohumas first went south when there was a lack of large herbivores on Juma. No buff, no giraffes, no zebra. They first went south to follow the buffalo. It's really remarkable. Even hyenas, they just travel and travel and walk and walk and walk until they find something that fills their nostrils and they think, hmm, I want this. We are so far away from the Juma Dane and yet we found the whole clan there. Well, not the entire clan, but lots of them. There were six or seven members. They must be really thirsty, although they've had blood as hot. Maddie, it does depend what stage the cubs are at, what age. I'm just going to catch up with them. It's quite easy to lose lions when it's summer. But generally speaking, she can leave them for long bouts. I mean, when we watched Amber Eyes and Purple Eyes and Chile, they all had cubs last year. They will leave their cubs stashed in a den, and it's at a very, very young age. Leopards and lions, even hyenas, learn this lifestyle, feast or famine. They have to wait for food. It's not going to be on the daily. And of course, lions need to hunt in order to keep their energy levels up, get nutrition for lactation. Lactation is very energetically costly for a female mammal. So they can leave their cubs for long bouts. And as the cubs get older, they'll leave them for longer. One, oh, one, two, three. I think we found the rest of the pride. Perfect. Here we go. Okay, as we try to reposition here, we're going to send you across to Swallow with some Kainsbach. Welcome back to Swallow. At the moment, we are looking at a small herd of Kainsbach. Some of you also might know them as Oryx. So one of the interesting stories that I've learned over the years about Oryx is that they actually gave rise to the myth of a unicorn. Now, one of the species of Oryx, which we find in the desert environments of North Africa, um, when standing on a dune um, with their body uh, laterally towards you, actually looks like an antelope with a single horn. And hence the reason why... Um, they also refer to as horse-like antelopes. So just a little interesting story about where the myth of a unicorn comes from. So one of the things that we can notice with this group is predominantly females. It's a breeding herd. And what we we'll also notice is that the females generally have longer horns than the males. And on average, these horns can reach lengths of up to 1.2 meters. Now, there was a question a few days ago about how long can kudu horns get. And I can remember there was a bull that was sold as a trophy bull uh, roughly eight years ago. If I remember correctly, his nickname was um, Hardis. And he had a horn length of 1.47, um, which is literally, sorry, 1.74 centimeters which is literally one centimeter shorter than when I am tall. So coming back to 
the horns. These are also used very effectively as weapons, both against a number of different predators such as lion. And the males will also use these horns in combat against one another when it comes to territorial disputes. So one of my favorite sightings that I had many years ago at Swalu was where a group of wild dog saw a female with a very young calf. And for a period of almost 45 minutes, these group of wild dogs were trying to separate this calf from the mother. And she was so effective with protecting the calf by simply using her horns as well as kicking. And every time that the dogs came close, she already changed direction with the horns and she uses them in a sideways sweeping as well as she lunges forward and comes forward. And as with the dogs were trying to come in from behind again, she gave these little backward kicks and then positioned herself again in such a way that the calf was protected at all times. So yesterday we were also mentioning about a number of adaptations that the Gemsbok have, and they can tolerate a lot more heat than many other, other antelope species. They can also tolerate much drier conditions. So we mentioned this morning about the Gemsbok cucumber, which provides them with water, and the drier months, when there's not a lot of grass around and the grass starts turning yellow or coppery in color, and has got a very low nutritional value, they still manage to feed on these grasses and obtain a high amount of moisture. But their strategy is to go and feed on these grasses at night when the grasses actually extract more new moisture from the atmosphere. And they reckon that some of these grasses can absorb as much as 20% um, of moisture from the atmosphere at night time making it more palatable and more easily to digest for the antelope. Good morning, Justin. To answer your question on the facial markings, it's most likely to break up the pattern of the body. We see quite often with a number of different species of animals as well as birds that they've got black and white bands coming through the face to break up the shape, to make it less obvious um, to a predator over a far greater distance. One of the other things that we notice is that many of the antelope species that we do find over here is darker at the top and lighter at the bottom. This is also a strategy to break up the shape of the body. Good morning, Rian, and to answer your question, can the horns of the Oryx kill you? Yes, they can. Um, any animal that is going to be pushed into a position where they are trapped, where they're going to be forced to attack you, can lead to a serious injury. I can remember many years ago, a very good friend of mine went running in a small reserve in Western Cape, and she had earphones in her ear at that moment and she by accidentally ran into a hemspork that had a reputation to be quite aggressive. The animal actually bored right through her leg and she was very fortunate that there was a vehicle that came from the front a minute or two later and they managed to stop the bleeding and save her life. And so you can guess with those incredibly sharp horns, they can be incredibly dangerous. So when we used to catch RX with game capturing operations, the first thing that we also used to do is put a sleeve of black plastic pipe over the horns so that in case that the animal does attack, that it couldn't injure us seriously by stabbing us with these horns. We'll be spending a little bit more time with this Gemsbok, but in the meanwhile, 
we're going to hand you over to Lauren, who is currently viewing some lions. Marty's just north of Kayamanzi Dam. Apology, everyone. I'm just giving a little update on the video. Uh, thanks. I'll check you in the afternoon. Copy, copy. We had such a lovely reunion. I just, as you last left us, they'd all made up. The pride just reunited and it was so lovely. Again, it's probably anthropomorphizing a little bit, but the joy that we see when lions reunite like that, you can really see it. They do separate, it's entirely normal, but they prefer to be together. The females in a pride, they show a lot of tenderness towards one another, especially towards the females in the pride than so the males. <laughs> always like to say they just put up with the males but it was so joyous it was so lovely to see them all reunite like that and i don't think they've been separated for long they just like to be together and i think now because the temperatures are so ring they're probably going to be lala as we say out here for the rest of today but they're right next to the dam and you're right, they do look a little bit skinny. It wouldn't surprise me if they hunted again tonight. And the dogs were really not too far away from here. It's remarkable how sometimes everything just happens in the one area. There's nothing and then there's everything all at once. just managed to all find themselves little patches of shade. Sadly, we have not managed to find ourselves a patch of shade. The lions are taking it all. Telematis, can we have some shade, please? <laughs> that is the face of someone who's very hot and tired. And lions really are remarkable. You know, this reputation that they have for being lazy is just so wrong. It's just because they're nocturnal. So humans tend to spend time with them during the day because we're diurnal. And we just see them sleeping, which is exactly the same as if the lions here, the Talamatis, were to come to your bedroom at nighttime and watch you. They would be like, oh my goodness, she is so lazy. All she does is sleep. Every night I come here, Lauren is sleeping and snoring <laughs> because they don't see us during the day. It's exactly the same concept and that's why they get this reputation for being lazy, but they're not. And they must recuperate. Any animal that spends energy from just walking, patrolling, calling, hunting, stalking, suckling, they need to replenish that just as we do, just as humans do. And therefore, they need to rest, recuperate, digest and then get ready for the night ahead. They can't go into deficit. Energetics is very, very important for animals. They can't run at a deficit. Especially animals like lions and leopards. Especially mammals, sorry, let me take that back, mammals. Reptiles can run at a bit of a deficit in a way because they can sort of estivate or go into brumation. It's all about energetics. Beverly, I'm not sure. I've seen videos, of course, not with my own eyes, but I have seen videos of lone lionesses going after things like giraffes. Now, it doesn't normally end in success. The fact that they are a social cohesive unit means they're able to cooperate during takedowns, and that's why they can take down such big animals, because they do it together, they cooperate. But I have seen images of lone lionesses trying to stalk giraffes, zebra, wildebeest. When they're hungry, they'll try anything. And all it takes really is for you, the giraffe to trip 
Once that giraffe is on the ground, a lone lioness probably could kill it. A female, at least, maybe a female giraffe. But lone lionesses will hunt. We watched it numerous times up in the Maasai Mara. But normally it's things like warthog or antelopes. The bigger the prey, the more danger for the lioness itself. Okay, we're going to sit tight with the Talamatis, but I believe Andrew has found some water buck having a disagreement. Thanks, Lauren. So we now got an antelope here, which is a, a water buck. It looks like all, probably four of them there. And then also with the impalas in the shade, so it's coming to a stage where now I think it's probably way too hot, or five of the male water buck. So we're near one of the big dam here, where it's Chido Chido Dam, where mainly antelope like water buck. They spend a lot of their time near the big lake like this. I think this is where their name comes from. The name water buck. And they, they lack water, where they use water to escape from the danger. When they chase by chance of lions or dogs, wild dogs and they were able to use waters to to survive as long as there's no many of the crocodile in there because in the water it's a chance that the crocodiles are there waiting for anybody who comes to drink or who come to swim by chances it's the only time they would be caught by a crocodile It looks like a whole bunch of males where they do that. Males, they form bachelor group. Sometimes females, they also separate away. They spend a lot of time on themselves. Where males also have their own time where they all just bachelor head, like just we see right here. And the dominant male, you would can sometimes be politely enough to accept any of these non-dominant bulls coming into the area. Especially these are still under the age and they're still too far away to compete for a dominant. And the dominant male wouldn't mind having them in his territory. And they're all fluffy, hairy animal. Heron. So you want to know how do the water buck defend themselves from predators? So usually they run, run into water. So the water is actually main key for them to be able to survive from lions, or wild dogs. They depend on water a lot. So, but not only them. That is a chance. Also, you see, could you also run into the water if been chased for quite a long? But water bucks, since their name come from where they actually rely on water quite a lot, so they use water quite often when they're chased. When these dogs, wild dogs, sometimes when they chase, they chase non-stop. Eventually, these antelope run into the water, and then, of course, this is the only time you would find a rest. They have, all they do, they have to wait around, surround the water hole. So we're still going down to that water hole there and just to see what else could be around to that water hole. My favorite animal is a leopard, purely because I just think they are just the epitome of feline grace and power and the way they can move about in any environment and remain hidden until they want to be seen, I just find it incredibly intoxicating and they're amazingly beautiful.
Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. Join our Explorers program so we can keep on sharing nature with the world. For a monthly subscription, you will have the opportunity to win fantastic Wild Earth expeditions, have access to an animal identification app, receive weekly highlights from our shows, and much more. All the money will go to keeping these live safaris on air, which in turn connects a global population with nature. My name is James Hendry and I work here at Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands on the western fringes of the Greater Kruger National Park. My favourite part of getting questions from viewers is that we get to have long and varied discussions about all sorts of different aspects of nature. Because our audience comes from all over the world, it's very special to have different perspectives from everywhere. If you want to submit a question on Wild Earth, you need to register on our website. Once registered, go to the Live Safari page and submit your question beneath the live feed. Welcome to my car. This is Wendy, and she's my favorite. She would love to have your name engraved on her so you can be with her every single time she goes on a safari here in Juma. If you become a Wild Earth Explorer, you will have the opportunity to buy an engraved tag which we will attach to her. We will make sure to send you a digital picture to show you exactly where you are sitting on her. You will have front row seat in every single sighting. Welcome back again to Tswalu. At the moment we're watching a single wildebeest bull that's resting in the shade. Where we are sitting at the moment in the direct sunlight, it's probably already 27 degrees Celsius and the Kalahari has got the potential of reaching temperatures well over 40 degrees Celsius, which can be incredibly hot, especially in such a dry environment. So one of the strategies that many of the animals will take is as soon as it starts heating up, they will move into the shade. And generally we also find on much warmer days that the activity period therefore is much shorter than under normal cooler temperature days. So the strategy of this wildebeest is simply to remain there. Oh, it seems if he's breaking the rule and he's actually moving off. And um, just to come back to the wildebeest in terms of conservation of energy, we generally find that most of these animals will eat when there's still a lot of moisture in the grass, as mentioned earlier. Once their stomachs is full, or their first stomach chamber is full, they will quite often retreat into the shade, and then from there on rechew their food, swallow it a second time, and then the food will be digested through a number of other stomach chambers while they are resting. So with this being a single wildebeest bull, it's most likely to, safe to say that it's a territorial male, and that he protects this area and all around, um, all year round. So what we find in South Africa is that historically that wildebeest would be migratory, but because of the erection of fence lines and a number of man-made structures over the years, they've lost the ability to migrate and therefore their territories have become sedentary. However, if we do look at wildebeest in East Africa that migrate, these males will actually have mobile territories that will differ from day to day. It can really get very warm over here. And one of the things that we've learned is to at least take two to three liters of water for yourself on a hot day when you are guiding. And then in, in the winter, we experience precisely the opposite in terms of temperatures, where our temperatures can drop as much as 10 degrees Celsius at night. I think if I remember correctly, 12 was the record. And then also, in the daytime, early mornings, temperatures can be as low as 2 to minus 2 degrees Celsius while you're out and drive. It's quite funny to actually look at guides working at Swalu in the middle of the winter. They do look like if they actually are heading off to an Antarctic expedition. We often wear long sleeve clothing with thermal base layers underneath, then with a, a scarf around your face, a cap on your head, and then double layer of gloves, a pair of sunnies, and we tend to actually get more burnt in the winter months from 
a wind chill rather than that we get burnt in the summer months from the sun itself. it's very possible that animals can faint and I've actually seen elephant calves becoming so stressed that they will just go and lie down on the ground but if it's a real faint it's difficult to say and in some cases I've actually seen that um, animals that do become heat stressed uh, such as young little elephant calves will often be assisted by mothers and once or twice I've actually seen it where these mothers will actually force their trunks down their throat to get moisture out of the stomach and then to spout that onto those little young calves to prevent any further heat stress from developing. Mm. So we're going to move on and see if we can maybe get another view of this Fildebius and then talk about, a little bit more about him. Now the shade is obviously moving. I think we're just going to go forward, Joanne, actually. I've decided the rest of the pride are all up here. I think we're getting much better visuals up here. Now it was that lost its life this morning and apparently the Talamatis had a huge fight with the crocodile. Yes, you. So I'm going to stay with them just a little bit longer, but they're going, they're pretty flat and I do want to... Okay, this has not given me the views I hoped for. Bear with me. <laughs> I do want to check the dam to see if there's any signs of the carcass or scavengers or the crocodile. So we'll stay with them for about five, ten more minutes and then we'll just go check out Kayamanzi Dam. They're just here. Hello everybody, it's nice to see your faces. Yes. That patch of shade is very small. I think we're slowly but surely being thrown back into the Lowveld summer. And the animals always take the shade. <laughs> it's a tricky position for us. your partner in bed and it's so hot that you just sort of put your pinky toe next to them and say I'm still here but we are not spooning or hugging it's far too hot but I'm still here that's what these lines are going to start to do As I mentioned, I'll stay here a little while, but then I want to go and investigate what happened at the dam. So for now, you guys are going to go back across to Andrew. Great. So, well, we had a nyala in this group of impalas in the water park here. It's amazing. Usually they all group of only species of Nyala sometimes, but well, it's very interesting to see this Nyala in, in the middle of the whole herd of impalas here, yeah, all full of impalas and uh, some water back. I'm not sure. It could happen that maybe she lost her own herd and then come to join the other antelopes. It's 
So we just check the dam, there's nothing. So all of these antelope, I think they might later make their way down to the drink or they already had a drink. So she's just gonna move politely across between them. I'm not sure if she'll spend a lot of time here because when we drove past here, she was not around. She probably just came from uh, somewhere. problem if you stick with the impala because it's also they're all antelope so there's no fight between yeah she disappeared she's probably looking for her own females Tommy yes so on uh, in Yala so they both have a stripe so it's, it comes so much visible for females because then they're yellow in color the males are dark but they're less stripe uh, the males than the females so they all have a stripe but these type of antelope they mean to be in a very dense area river it happens maybe she hide a baby well, i couldn't tell whether she's lactating or anything like that. So I'm going to take another time here just to see what these antelope, they're probably going to go down to drink there while we are around here. Some of them already walking past by us, by us heading towards the water. Slowly, one by one, they're leaving this uncomfortable patch of shade. This, this one, I think it's one of the young males at the back. He's loving it. He's got prime position. Blue eyes just got up. The injured lioness has also got up. They're just moving. It's not comfortable here. It's too hot. Although in seeing that, this log over here, who literally looks like a log, <laughs> that looks comfortable. That is a good choice. Oh, the young at not bad, I was getting up as well. He's being very needy, the young sub-adult male with the sort of darker hair under his chin. He's being very needy, he keeps annoying every single lioness. Here we go, look, look. <laughs> I think they want to sleep. Very handsome. He's going to grow into a mighty fine male lion. Look at that mane already. Her bum fluff is not quite a mane. Oh, and just like that. Nose to nose. They don't really understand the concept of personal space lions. They really don't understand it. <sighs> Roger, that's the right word, it's not bum fluff, is it? It's beard, that's the one. He's got a beard, he's not got a mane. It's very fashionable, apparently, for men to have big, long, thick beards at the minute. And that's exactly what this young Talamati is doing, opting for fashion. But it's really not a mane, it's just the hair starting to develop. He's getting a little bit older. He's got a long way to go. You'll see changes in the sort of location of the hair, the coloration of the hair, the length of the hair. He'll start to develop a little mohawk. There's lots of changes that male lions go through, but that's that Roger is a beard. I obviously can't comment on having a beard myself, but I can imagine it can get quite annoying. Jonathan, no. They are wild animals. They perceive their environment entirely different from us. If 
I stepped out of, they're very habituated to the car. As you can see, they, they choose to walk in front of the car. There's no fear. The car is just this thing that's always present. But if I was to step out of this car right now, they would all jump up. I would become a threat. I'd become a primate. I would become something completely different. I do think they can identify presence on a car. Absolutely. Because they give you direct eye contact so they know where your eyes are. But they're seeing you as part of the car. But they're aware that you're there, if that makes sense. But once I step off the car, I become something different. If I start walking towards them, then I become a threat. It's scary. They would not want to interact with us. During the day, they would probably run away. <clears throat> but at night time, they could easily take you down. They're not here to interact with humans. It's very important that we always remember we're just mere observers in a wild space. Okay, so I really am going to say goodbye to the Talamatis now just to have a look and see if I can spot anything at the dam. But for now, off you pop to Angala. Right, so we have just found a nice little flock of ground hornbills. We've been very lucky recently and we've actually been finding a lot of ground hornbills on the reserve. I don't know if this is the same flock. Yesterday we also actually, actually saw some on drive, but there were four of them, so three adults and one chick. Now I've only counted three. Oh, the chick might a little bit further back in the thicket. They really like these open grassland areas. And as you can see, they're just walking along, eyes on the ground. You can see them picking at things every now and again, looking for insects, maybe small reptiles. Sometimes see them catching snakes and scorpions, even small mammals. What you sometimes see is they head towards these middens and they'll scratch amongst the dung and catch the little beetles. Oh, we got something. What is that? Probably insects. And I'm sure this time of year with all these termites around, with all the alates flying out around, they're also taking advantage of that. This one looks like it's not completely full grown yet the the flap well that's the the skin on the face and the neck actually still looks slightly orange in color it's not as red as the others i really like these birds So I, sorry, I didn't hear that question. Jerry, um, Becca just repeated it to me. Would these birds attack humans? Jerry, I've never heard of, of ground hornbills attacking humans. They're generally quite scared of us. Um, so usually when we approach them, especially on foot, they'll just fly away. Um, what we have seen here, though, is um, this time of year, a few years ago, one of the rangers saw them uh, catching a young impala, an impala lamb. And, you know, that's, that's quite a strange thing. Sometimes they'll catch smaller mammals, but something as big as an impala lamb is, is quite a strange thing to see them. Kind of broke its back and paralyzed it, and then just started to how to eat it. Um, so the ranger <laughs> just decided to leave. I think it was quite a hard thing to watch, especially because it was still alive. But yeah, we, we sometimes see them uh, catching tortoises as well. 
and, and what they'll do is they'll just flip the tortoise over and then they'll just keep them at the bottom of the of the shell and yeah they'll they'll hollow them out they've got very strong bills very thick set bills as you can see there I one just got an insect, the one in the back there. Oh, and it's gone. What you also sometimes see, especially if they're walking along the tree line, you'll see them looking up into the trees, um, probably looking for little lizards and things, but I've seen them catching chameleons as well. So then they'll fly up, grab the chameleons, also guzzle that down. I'm trying to see, I'm just going to reverse a little bit, they're moving behind us. Let's just see. Okay. Let's see if there are males or females, so the females have this beautiful blue patch just below the bull at the base of the bowl. Like a male, the one that just caught something there. And then there's a youngster. It doesn't look like there are any females here. I think we're going to leave them else we can find. Welcome back to Tswalu. And at the moment, we're just admiring these beautiful white browed sparrow weaver nests and the clouds that are just slowly moving up ahead. So these are thin little wispy clouds known as cirrus clouds. They're generally indicators of good weather for the moment, which we are very happy about after having two full days of almost rain that kept us from going out. So for us this morning, it's been a very productive morning in terms of seeing a lot of Kalahari animals, in terms of quite unique things as well, and being able to cover some distances and see some of the beautiful landscape and different habitats which Tswalu has to offer. In total, there's five different habitats which we encounter within this area, of which the dunes and the Koranaberg was only one or two of those that we saw this morning. It is, and it's also quite interesting is that ones that tend to be open, and uh, we often find that once these white bright sparrow weavers don't always use them, certain species of finches will actually also use them um, to stay warm as well as cool at the different times of the year during the winter or during the summer months. believe what we have just found. A European ruler. I was just talking about them. It's flown off, but it's not being very cooperative. The Europeans are back. They didn't come last year. Apparently Andrew saw one yesterday. He didn't tell me, but they're back. Let me just get my... Oh, it's up there. I think it's up in this tree quite far away. Let me get my binos out. Just flew away. Let me see if I can find it. Now, there was nothing happening at the dam, I'm afraid. I didn't see any signs of a carcass or scavengers or a crocodile sitting very happily with a full belly. How frustrating. The roller was right there. It was definitely a European, though. Let me just quickly get my bird book out. And I'll see if I can 
show you all the difference between the rollers. They're all beautiful. Two, eight, six. My year of birth, 86. Oh, just gave the game away. There we go. So if we look, let's just say number three right here, you want? That is obviously your lilac breasted roller, the one we see. It's common. We see it everywhere, we hear it everywhere. And then if you look at number four, that is the European roller. And they're a summer visitor. So once they arrive, they're fairly common. But when they're not here, of course, we don't see them. And it appears that they've arrived. So they're quite similar, but obviously the European is far more turquoise, a lot less purple. And then just down here, number five, one that we also see, but not so often out here, is a purple roller. So they're all magnificent. They're all absolutely stunning. But this was the European one right here that I hope to show you and have clearly failed. So there we go, that is the rollers. But at least we did manage to show you the lions. There's been a lot of failures this morning, but one must go on, the show must go on. That's such great news, the Europeans are back normal migratory patterns resume. Jared, very good question. Why are they called rollers? Rock and rolling. Well, basically, during the sort of season, which is summer, most birds meet in summer because of the plentiful amount of food and insects and water and life, basically. They sort of do a roll mid-air. It's beautiful. The male will actually go up and he'll start rolling. It looks like he's doing a somersault or a tumble turn mid-air. And it's quite an elaborate, beautiful dance, if you like, aerobatics, and that's where they get the name roller from beautiful story, but it really does look like they're just rolling through the air. I'll make it my mission to try and put a European roller on camera this afternoon. Birds are tricky. <laughs> They'll sit perfectly in the minute they hear live, live, they fly off. It's not easy. But at least we know where the Talamatis are for this afternoon. The dogs crossed over on my feet, but it gives potential tension in the air. Every vehicle that we pass, we obviously all stop and speak to. And the tension with regards to the lack of leopards is right. Cut it with a knife. Everyone is missing the leopards. But I remember last year and I remember the year before, it's, it's normal for summer. Once you go a few days without them, you lose track of where they are. That's the lilac breasted roller, but if it stops, we can give you a view of it. Do you see it on that dead tree over there? It's not the European, I'm afraid, but it's still in the same family, so at least you're seeing a roller of sorts. The lilac breasted roller is the most iconic. Very noisy, insectivorous. Glamorous, very glamorous. Imagine having all those colours. Ah, so what a drive it's been. The sun is well and truly back to grace us with its presence. And I hope you all enjoyed the diverse range of animals we were able to show you. So thank you for jumping on board. It is always our pleasure. We shall see you this afternoon. Have a great day. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here in Northfield in the South Pumalanga. This afternoon, we have Andrew on camera and Johan. We have Andrew as a guide this afternoon and Johan on camera. And this is how we're going to be taking you into the safari. Looking at beautiful elephants feeding right here. Welcome aboard to your very own safari through the African bush.
Juma Private Gum Reserve here where we're sitting with a beautiful elephant feeding and my name is Andrew on camera I have Johan so this is how we're planning to take you on a safari alive and it looks like it's actually a nice beautiful elephant to begin with feeding so all the mother of the young one there actually it's quite humid today which is the temperature for the day 32 degrees 90 Fahrenheit where most of the animals especially with the elephants they wouldn't really like to go around the watering holes afterwards and then maybe wallow in there or swim or sometimes freeze in the shadow eat as much as they can it's so much grass is that it's already green remember everyone we're coming to you live from this uh, location so your questions and comments will be welcome uh, send them to uh, kids questions at world earth tv also on hashtag world earth also at fc as well as world earth tv slash explorer those of you who haven't been a part of the show or haven't actually been part of us you're more than welcome to go to our website and sign up that you can be able to have access through the question and everything that you wanted to know about these wild animals that we have right now. I'm not sure, it's up there. She's probably draining some water under the ground where it just rained for sure. It could be that maybe she holds quite a few water on a truck where they usually can be rare but they can hold the amount of um, water that they might sometimes feed up through the trunk when they need them. We're looking at the female most here where this is actually easy to tell every time you see a herd where the females and their young ones and that's how you know for sure that you're looking at the a breeding herd of elephants. So I'm gonna stay in Putia just to see if the whole herd crossed this road while I'm linking you to Lauren. Good afternoon. Yes, both Andrew and I are speaking today. Isn't it wonderful? Marcel really is a hero. My name is Lauren. I do have Simon on camera and we are off to a bumbling start here in Juma. It's very humid. Almost feels like there's no air to breathe. Blue sky here. Strange sky here and it's very, very humid. Lots of moisture in the air, so we all feel nice and sticky, which can only mean the animals will feel very sticky as well. So we're hoping that if we do a bit of a water hole check, we may get lucky. I am really desperate for a leopard now. I've been having the most wonderful hyena interactions, most wonderful bird sightings, including flamingos, reptile sightings but I'm really missing leopards. So I know that Hukamuri is, an, is in Arethusa. Tiana, Tiani's on Simbambili, but very, very far west where our signal does not reach. And those are the only leopards I know about. So I'm going to go south, down into Chitwa and see what I can find for today. Hopefully we will get lucky with 